live. Live. We're live, you guys. Uh, oh, real quick, Kristen, I just checked Twitter. It is working on Twitter. We are fully functional on the Twitterverse. Okay, for some reason, it was that was weird. I was just trying to share the tweet, and it kept telling me Twitter's down. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I just retweeted it with a whole bunch of awesome. finger points, like, hey, check this sweet uh, stream out here on the Twitters. So uh, we are fully functional across the board. Uh, welcome, <laughs> everyone, to Casa Live. Uh, though, I see you in chat. Rog, Ian Thomas is here. Mallory Gates, good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today is Saturday, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. know what day it is anymore. You guys, I'm going to go ahead and start with, Hey, how are you? But for myself in kind of like an apology, it's been a long day and I got like basically this much sleep. So if you guys see me like yawning or tired, it's not because Alex is boring. He's not. I'm just, I'm tired today, you guys. <laughs> it's been a long <laughs> week. I've dealt with a ton of uh, sciatic pain this week and work and lack of sleep, and it is all hitting me real hard today. So I'm going to do my best to not like yawn during this stream. Got myself a whole can full of caffeine over here to keep me going. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's that's my hey, how are you to myself. Kristen, hey, how are you? Good. Don't yawn because then you're going to start making me yawn. <laughs> I know. It's contagious. It's contagious. Very contagious. Just talking. People are going to tune in and we're all just going to be up here yawning. <laughs> it was like, what is happening at Casa? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Excited for the show today. And um, not much going on this week. It's just been really cold and we got that crazy whiteout snow last night and crazy wind that just. Oh, I hate when things were falling off the house and I don't like that. My husband, poor husband's out there this morning picking stuff up off our front lawn, picking up stuff off the neighbor's lawn. Oh, <laughs> like, no. Uh, yeah. And then Shingles phone and line got pulled from the house. And thank God we don't have a landline anymore But for the phone. But yeah, I don't like that. That's just That just makes me very nervous. Storms make me nervous. My husband, if there's a storm, he's sound asleep. Me, I'm, mm -mm. Mm. I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah. Nice gentle rain I'm okay with. <laughs> yeah, we, we had the, we had all the snow and, and wind as well. Um, I was telling you guys before we started the show, when I was out dealing with snow this morning, uh, I actually had to pull my truck over and stop and wait for like 15 minutes because it was so bad. I couldn't even see the front of my truck. Oh, Kristen, you're muted. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I muted because my daughter came downstairs and I was telling her to be quiet. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, see. Uh, Anyhow. <laughs> anyways, on. Alex, Children, hey, how them. are you? Got to try not to kill them. I'm good. I'm cold. Um, I, I will go also apologize in advance if, if I end up yawning. It's probably because I'm bored with something that I'm saying. So, um, <laughs> No, it's just because I started it and it's contagious. <laughs> but no, yeah, I'm, I'm good. We, we got some of the wind. We didn't get the white out snow squalls over here and the, the tippy top of New York. Um, but it, yeah, it's been windy. So it's cold in our very drafty house. And uh, I just I can't get warm today. Everything is freezing. Um, but um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you uh, yawning yet? That was a pretty boring update. <laughs> no, no, I'm not yawning yet. No, not yet. I probably will be here in a little while. Uh, I don't think about yawning. I swear to God, I'm going to yawn. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to have a, a whole discussion on, okay, scrap the whole plan for the show today. We're just going to talk about the science of yawning today, mm -hmm. you guys. Anyways, uh, <laughs> Rog, yeah, uh, my back is starting to feel better. Um, to anybody who follows me on social media this past week on Twitter was all about sciatica uh, and, and my sciatic nerves, um, which oh this week was this week was rough. You guys, I deal with sciatic pain in the winter pretty regularly, just about every winter. It's, you know, a mix of the, the, the cold being out in the cold a lot. So your muscles tense and shivering and things like that. And then uh, just the work I do dealing with snow, uh, shoveling and things like that is awful for your back. It's just terrible for your back. And so that's where a lot of my my pain stems from with, with sciatica. And um, most years, I end up with like moderate pain. You know, I get a few days of it and I'm like sore. I'm kind of achy. 
this week I was like laid out. Like I was, I was done. I just, I stayed as horizontal as possible for as long as possible. It was rough. And I reached out to the Twitter verse and was like, help me. <laughs> who has good, who has good advice? Because everything that I knew to do was not working. And thanks to a whole bunch of people for their suggestions, because I'm definitely feeling much better, much better. Glad to hear. You got to stretch the piriformis muscles. That's the key. Remember, guys, don't skip piriformis day. Okay. It sounds like it sounds like yoga and inversion. Basically. Oh yeah. Everybody was like, you know, get an inversion table. Um, and I'm like, just... I don't have the money for an inversion table. Does somebody just want to come like drape me up by my ankles for a little while? I've had an inversion table. Well, it's expensive, for... actually, but I I have one tucked behind my door and I just they're so heavy trying to drag the darn thing out and my back hurts. <laughs> and I'm just like so I just sit there <laughs> yeah. and complain and my husband's like um, there's that thing right there. And I'm like, I know, can you get it out for me? <laughs> and then when I'm upside down and the dogs all want to give me kisses. So, you know, oh, like sure. I need a, I need sure. a better place for it. <laughs> yeah. My cats, I used to do yoga pretty regularly. And something I really need to get back into doing for my back because I also have a, a bad vertebrae up between my shoulder blades. And so I used to do yoga regularly, almost daily. And I can tell you my cats love it when I do yoga especially especially our female cat because especially if i'm doing something like you know um where you're down on all fours and you're you're kind of like arching your back stretching your back out she'll just hop up on my back you ever seen goat yoga it's like goat yoga yep, like goat yoga cat. <laughs> yeah yeah so all right we, we're digressing really bad we, we have we have drifted <laughs> far from the One far question, from the though, path of, um am i glitching or is logan glitching does anybody see uh, you 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 pause from time to time, Kristen, but uh, it's so not. It's I don't know. It's it's not interrupting your audio or anything. It's it's better ah, than it has so I'm been plugged in, in the past. Oh, into the. Oh well, yeah. Oh, you see, to me, it's oh, worse because you guys soon. keep buffering on me, so it's like. <laughs> of course, see, and this is weird because I've got it plugged into the hard lines, so I don't know what's going on. Can you not hear yeah. me again? It's all that. It's all that wind. It's all that wind and snow. <laughs> Maybe that phone line wasn't just the phone line. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. well we'll 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 trudge through you know it's it's not a kasa stream if there aren't a few dangle clacks <laughs> sorry you guys way. remember guys grassroots af over on. here <laughs> grassroots <laughs> af so all right well if we're uh if if alex is ready are you ready alex are you yep, the ready? ready all right let's get into some legislation you guys <laughs> All right, Mr. Clark, what do you got for us this week? What do we need to keep our eyes and ears on? <clears throat> Excuse me. I just had the spit go down the wrong hole here. Hold on. <laughs> as long as the water doesn't also go down the wrong hole, too. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> That's not where any of that belongs. Um, <laughs> so uh, a little bit of uh, uh, a much... <laughs> Much, much, much lighter rundown than we had last week. Uh, we'll keep this relatively brief. Um, Alaska, we're still keeping an eye on SB 45. Uh, no new update as for, you know, next steps or hearings there. Uh, but if you are in Alaska, go ahead and participate in our engagement there. Um, Hawaii, again, there's more than a dozen bills in Hawaii. Um, the best way to take action on these is to comment through the bill page. Uh, but that option is only available when the bill is scheduled, when bills are scheduled for hearings. <coughs> Excuse me, still dealing with the spit. Um, uh, and uh, there should be some activity going on there. Hawaii is crazy. They go through three or four or eight different committees before it actually gets voted on. Um, and uh, oftentimes a lot of these bills don't end up becoming law, but you know, a lot of damage has already been done in Hawaii. So I'm still very concerned with what's going on there. <coughs> oh God, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> do, do you need a bottle of water? Do you, you I, no, of I'm I'm gonna work through it. It's, gonna, it's just my body has to do its thing and and remove the just the, a champion the saliva thing, from the he's wrong, over here from the wrong literally tube. choking Clem? and he he's not gonna take a break. He needs to get through this legislation. Champion, this is, this is live TV, folks. <clears throat> um, so uh, the new additions to our list of active calls to action are going to be Colorado, 
Um, we've been talking about this for probably a month and a half, two months now. Um, HB 22-1064. This is the flavor ban. Uh, we're not going full court press on this just yet, but if you are in Colorado and want to start making contact with lawmakers, it's a good idea to start doing that. Um, also, if you are in Colorado and uh, feel comfortable about writing an op-ed in your local newspaper or whatever gets to the state circulation, um, this is also a good time to do that. Several other people from you know the think tanky world uh, have have put up their op-eds. Other folks uh, from uh, specific coalitions uh, have have published things. Um, I think we also put one on our blog this week. Um, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, if you are playing the home game, um, we've got some. Uh, oh no, this is not this is not the op-ed. We tweeted about it. Anyway, uh, there are op-eds uh, being written in Colorado. So um, if that's your... Oh, if that's your, I know which one you're talking about. If that's your bailiwick, um, by all means, feel free to pen one of those. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have any... Uh, there's no committee hearing or anything scheduled for this just yet. Um, so uh, kind of taking this lightly as we go in. Um, certainly spread the word. This will likely be a threat in Colorado. Uh, and uh, as we've mentioned several times, this is sort of the state's response to Denver not passing their own flavor ban. Um, I should phrase that differently. Denver wisely rejecting a flavor, flavor ban, uh, specifically the mayor of Denver. Kudos um, for looking out for your residents. Um, the next additions, let's see, what did we do? Oh, yeah, we're going back up to Maine. Um, really quick, I'm just going to show them that this is, whoops, nope, that's the wrong one. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's, gonna, it is I'm on gonna, our. This is still ahead, an excellent down. page on our site. It you want to see the call to action? Is that what's? Uh, no, no. What's I was going to show out? them the. Um, hold on. Let me put it in the other. Oh, one. the uh, the op ed. Yeah. yeah. It's it was actually an op ed by um, uh, Gil Cisneros, and he was talking about um, about the consequences of. Uh, I, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was specifically. How do I, do, uh, how do I switch my, where my stream is going to? Yeah, it, it was about the sort of the consequences on small businesses and um, Latino folks in uh, the United States and in Colorado um, and other, you know, minority communities and, and immigrant popula populations who, you know, for a lot of times their access to the American dream is starting a small business. And a lot of times that's going to be a corner store. Uh, and so taking away sales of these products is directly hurting them uh, and, and putting them at an even greater disadvantage. So um, it's an excellent op-ed. If we find it here while we're while we're up and live, we'll, we'll share the link. Um, I do believe you can find it on our Twitter feed as well. Um, but I will move swiftly along to Maine. Um, this is a, a flavor ban in Brunswick. Uh, they're doing the same thing in Maine that they've done in a lot of other states targeting municipalities, trying to create a patchwork of regulations further justifying some sort of state level action. Uh, obviously, we've been talking about two bills of interest in Maine. Uh, and uh, so we have our call to action up for uh, LD 1693, which is the one that's kind of moving right now. Um, but if you are in Brunswick, Maine, which we don't have a lot of members in Brunswick, uh, I, 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 I failed to go see what the population of the city was before we came on, uh, but we have just a few members there. Um, so if you know someone in Brunswick, Maine, who would love to have continue having access to flavored vapor products without having to go over to the next town, um, get them engaged in this. There is a public hearing coming up on Tuesday. That is Tuesday, February 22nd at 6.30 p.m., uh, you can testify in person, but they're urging people to try out remote testimony. Uh, and so uh, we link to the agenda down here with all of the particulars about participating remotely. Um, yeah. So uh, you got there's 20 minutes, uh, which gonna... will be reserved for people testify, test, invited guests, I assume, testifying in favor or opposition to the bill. And the public will be given. Uh, a maximum of three minutes uh, for each person testifying. Uh, and whenever they sort of phrase it that way, uh, if a lot of people sign up to speak, which 
it sounds like there may not be a lot of people signing up to speak. Uh, they could reduce that. So any comments that people put together, plan on only having three minutes. If you can get it done in a minute and a half or less, that's even better. Uh, and um, that is Brunswick, Maine. Yeah, I, uh, I can remember going to the Department of Health in Rochester during um, our, our stuff for the flavor ban here in New York. And a lot of people showed up to that. And uh, I was one of the last ones. And I had all this stuff written out for a three minute, like, you know, little spiel. And by the time I was able to speak, it was, you know, they had cut us down to a minute each. So I had to, you know, I had to trim what I wanted to say down. So be ready for that. This yeah. is our, this is our main state of Maine uh, Facebook group. Uh, we have 61 members. <laughs> so if you guys, um, well, it, you know, it would be great. Maine, if those... our group and make sure you sign up with Casa and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was jumping to the assumption that all 61 of those people live in, in Brunswick, and I'm totally wrong about oh. that. So just forget <laughs> I even started saying anything. <laughs> yeah, we we definitely need more people uh, from Maine joining, and um, especially, you know, and, and we have all 50 states plus also uh, territories that are in, you know, like um, Puerto Rico, I think that's considered a commonwealth or something like that. Um, Guam, we have... Uh, Facebook groups for everybody. So make sure you join. Yeah. And thanks, uh, Green Eyed Lady, for the uh, population of Brunswick at just just under 15,000 people. Um, so, yeah, the, no surprise. You know, it's a smaller municipalities. We don't have a lot of members. Um, but uh, that's certainly big enough that people should be concerned. And like I said, this is part of a, an overall campaign to um, you know, create a patchwork of regulation justifying some sort of state intervention. Um, so that I believe is pretty much it. Um, no updates really from uh, a lot of the legislation we discussed last week. Um, and I, I really, I have a full page of, of notes on stuff that I, I've been sort of talking about with other folks this week. Um, but again, this is uh, for anybody who's maybe just getting involved in this or, or maybe just last year, you're, you're getting involved in, in kind of the legislative advocacy aspect of this. Um, just know that when we have the on the odd numbered years, that's the beginning of the session. That's when we see uh, sort of a rush of introductions and, and you'll see all the horrible stuff that, that the legislatures are considering. Uh, and then in the even number years, uh, it, it's sort of uh, legislative activity light, uh, or in some states we'll have kind of a lightning round. I think New Mexico is one of those states that, uh, you know, gets all, everything done in like 45 days, um, something along those lines. Um, so it, it tends to be a little bit lighter in the even number of years. And that's why you're not hearing a whole lot. There's tons of bills out there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to move. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I've got for this week. Um, I know that there's probably some things that I miss, particularly in California. Um, we'll pick those back up next week if things start to get heated up. Um, but that should do it for now. Awesome. And I just wanted to thank Skip. She said, uh, no update from Minnesota. We're still waiting for asterisk, 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 asterisk to hit the fan. <laughs> Thanks, Skip. Much appreciated. All right. Well, Moving swiftly along, you guys ready for some takes? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Oh, <laughs> Give us a chance to say yes. <laughs> I, Alex said, let's do it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to push the button. I didn't even have a chance. I was like, <laughs> I was ready. Uh, it's okay. Uh, oh, okay, we're doing it. Yeah, perfect. We're doing uh, it. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, guess what? We actually decided who's going first. I know you guys look at that big things happening here at Casa. All right. I'm going to go first and I, we're going to, we're going to talk about, uh, the U S army here for, for just a minute. Public health officials warn about unregulated e-cigarette risks. Uh, this is a uh, very recent, uh, five days ago. Uh, so, uh, I don't land Landstall. Germany, I'm assuming is uh, the base where this this release came from or something like that. Right. Uh, public health officials are warning service members of the risks of using e-cigarette or vaping products from unregulated sources due to increased danger of vaping related 
lung injuries. Uh, so right out of the gate, we are talking about the incredibly poorly named Evali. Uh, we're talking about the, you know, in relation to the 2019 lung injuries um, associated with, any guesses, vitamin E acetate in street vapes, street THC carts, uh, unregulated street carts. Um, they go on to talk about how long uh, vaping has been commercially available since the early 2000s. And uh, there have been hundreds of reports of e-cigarette or vaping use associated lung injury or e in the general population since uh, public health officials advise against the use of e-cigarettes, but highly recommend purchase from purchase from known vendors if consuming. <sighs> You know, just when I start to think that we're going to not talk about a volley anymore, we're going to talk about a volley. Um, quote, many of the vaping oils and liquids procured from informal or unofficial sources are unregulated, which increases the risk of containing harmful or potentially harmful substances. Yeah, that goes for anything that you buy unregulated as far as substances go. Uh, it's just, you know, kind of comes along with with not being regulated. Um but this this is a uh, you know this is another this is another um, this is this is the U.S. Army listening to the CDC. Uh, the CDC is still unwilling to to address this this poorly named um, you know event lung injury, and uh, and yeah now we're issuing this warning out to service members. Uh, no mention here about vitamin E acetate. No mention uh, about specifically about THC cartridges bought from informal sources. They just kind of broadly, you know, say e-cigarettes or vaping products. Um, so no mention there. Really disingenuous to our service members who could definitely use these products to help them stop smoking if that's what they're trying to do. Um, but right here, this is uh, this is this is the one thing that really really stuck out to me that we, we dug this up. This is what we dug up. The, the Food and Drug Administration launched a probe into whether vaping can cause seizures. Do you guys remember this? Do you guys remember yeah. this? Oh, my God. And this the seizure thing was like right before we started seeing lung injuries, if I remember correctly. Like early, late 2018, early 2019 is when FDA launched that, that probe. And they basically asked for, you know, anecdotally to the public, has anybody had a seizure from vaping? Uh, yeah, which is just, you know, for them, yeah. if they, if they want anecdotes, it counts, but our 13,000 plus testimonials, it's a whole different story. Just, uh, just to, can, can I, add, uh, add on to your, your timeline there? Absolutely. Um, so this, I, 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 I'm a little foggy on when Scott Gottlieb, uh, left the agency but on it was on his way out the door he left us all the flaming bag of dog poop um <laughs> on our on our front steps mm -hmm. uh which was this uh claim that vaping was linked to causing seizures and there mm -hmm. were people who dug through the data and uh i, I think for perhaps uh well I, I don't exactly know who so i won't name names but uh, uh because i can't give them the credit appropriately but um <clears throat> that when people looked through some of these reportings through the i guess it was the adverse events reporting tool mm -hmm. uh they found that uh or just looking through the data that fda presented um that seizures among people who were using vapor products is actually lower than the the rest the of the general population, population. Yeah. so yeah. you know just as easily as fda could say something like <clears throat> vaping is linked to seizures uh, actual scientists could turn around and say, well, no, actually, there might be a protective effect here, mm -hmm. uh, considering that it's lower among people who vape. So, um, yeah, what a. What and a not only that, that real quick, I know this is a side <laughs> note with the seizure thing, but not only that, but they um, the FDA, even in its statement, admitted that some of the people had seizures before they started vaping and many of them had conditions mm -hmm. that were pre-existing um, well, I guess it would still fall under it, but conditions that would cause seizures and that there was definitely no causation shown. Um, and, you know, it's it's fair for them to ask people to tell them to see if they can try to figure out if there's any kind of link. But sure. the media just ran with it and the, the 
um, yeah. tobacco control just ran with it and said, oh, it's causing seizures rather than the FDA is looking into whether or not it causes seizures. <laughs> yeah, as with, as with the media typically doing what the media does. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, FDA should absolutely be asking these questions, right? Like if, if there's some reason for concern, uh, and I think all of us, you know, as as vapors, as, as people who use these products, we want to know if something is going on, you know, me, like, I want to know if something is right. happening, I want to know what's going on because the whole point of all of this was to reduce our risk. Right. Right. So we want to know. Um, but as you know, the media doing what the media does, they take everything and, and spin it out. So um, I don't really have much of a take here other than, um, you know, this is just really disingenuous. Um, and, and it's, well, it's a shame. Especially since they say they, the word illicit or is illicit or. They don't, non, they don't use the word they, illicit they, they, as much they as they the use word, they um, say unknown unregulated, sources. unofficial sources, unregulated. Sources, that was it. So they know that it has something to do with not stuff sold in stores. So they know that <clears> much. And it's, so it makes it seem almost like they purposefully left out THC because why else would they know about the unregulated part? You know what I mean? Sure. It, it, so, uh, uh, and this <laughs> right here, thing, this right here, this statement like leans into harm reduction in general. Um, obviously, e-cigarettes being, you know, a, a tool for harm reduction, but advise against the use of e-cigarettes, but highly recommend purchase from known vendors if consuming. Most people would say, hey, look, like the whole point of harm reduction is if you're going to use this thing, here is a set of pragmatic, practical practical things you can do to reduce your risk. So it, it's kind of along those lines. And I have a little appreciation there. They, uh, they advise against the use of e-cigarettes. Hey, look, if, if you're in the service and you're currently smoking and you're trying to quit, I would highly advise the use of e-cigarettes. Um, they've been shown to definitely help. But other than that, that's that's my take is this is just kind of a this is a lot of misinformation. I think this is, you know, um, the U.S. Army putting out what the CDC has to say about these these products and just kind of echoing that without any uh, any real digging of their own or anything like that. So not much of a, a take really other than an, it, it's a it's a big missed opportunity for, for service members. Um, and it's just disingenuous. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of concerned with this line here. Washington says an estimated 200 to 300,000 active duty service members are diagnosed with acute respiratory issues an annually. I, I kind of feel like if that's the case, I, vaping is the least of your worries. Oh, I, I absolutely. Mean, yeah. You know, there are lots of uh, concerns with military housing, uh, what kind of, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, war is, is hell. I, that's, you're, you're not, you're not deployed to, you know, some spa somewhere where the air is clean. Um, no. but it, you know, that, no. that's kind of, I, I didn't know that that's kind of shocking to me. And, and I, I think, um, certainly our, our military can do a much better job of making sure our service members are at least, a, you know, living in accommodation. That won't make them yeah. Sick. That would be nice. Yeah. 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 Well, the Anyways, thing is, then, you know, they weren't about, the about, you know, unregulated. They weren't. Can you hear me or no? Go ahead. Am yep. I? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, th that's the thing is that the, uh, by the same time of doing that, of saying, warning people against the unregulated vapor products, they banned regulated vapor products <clears throat> from the commissaries. So they're forced to go off base and try to find them someplace else. And then on top of that, they're warning vets not to use e-cigarettes, even if they're trying to quit smoking. That's also in the blog this week. So, yeah. I mean, the, the mixed messages are just, uh, people are just, basically they're just gonna look at this and go, oh, I shouldn't vape vaping. I mean, we are it's talking smoking. about the same it's military like that used to provide cigarettes in rations. So, yeah. We'll, All right. give you, we'll give you smokes, but don't vape. <laughs> I, don't, I definitely don't, I don't think, think the U.S. military is yeah, cigarettes and rations anymore. They that was a long time ago, but. Yeah. 
<laughs> Anyways, that's it for me on uh, on my take this week. Um, yeah, to any service members out there, just know that uh, you're definitely better off uh, using a, a, a regulated, uh, you know, commercially available e-cigarette um, than you are definitely using one, you know, off of the street and definitely better than smoking. And other smoke-free options. Absolutely. And other smoke-free products. Snooze, yeah. smokeless, uh, any of them. Which, of course, are more discreet. And so I'm sure in the field, that is a... Uh... Yeah, it's a very useful feature. Um, so yeah, should we uh, move along to the next take? Yeah, I don't know who goes next. That's you. Like All I paid I, attention I to was me. I was super selfish during that discussion. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going first, and then I just let you guys figure it out from there. Well, I, I, I'm in the middle, so I, I will. I'll, I'll I'll get going here. Um, so for my take uh, this week, I, I it's not really so much of a, a take as it is. Um, highlighting uh, uh, an interview. Sorry, me and me and Kristen just tried to pull. Uh, we just did it again. Tried to pull up Ern's comment on screen. Stop at the it! Same That's time. my job. <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt you, Alex. Ern said, but have Ern, we're fighting over your watching. comment. <laughs> cool. Um, so I I, I, just, I just wanted to kind of uh, you know other than it being included in our blog post, draw attention to the this interview uh, with Michelle Minton. Uh, by uh, James Hammond from the Mackinac uh, Public Policy, Mac Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Uh, it is, it's spelled Mackinac, but it's pronounced Mackinac. Um, so sorry for anybody in, in Michigan who had to live through me pronouncing that wrong. Um, but uh, this is an excellent interview. Um, as, as usual, Michelle Minton is very uh, just on top of it and uh, manages to in in a thirty minute uh, podcast articulate all of the the kind of big issues that we're facing. Um, if I did have uh, one take from this, uh, it is it is that um, in in this uh, podcast, um, uh, I think uh, you know one of the takeaways here is is something that that I think I've said several times and and probably others hopefully have. Uh, grasped onto um, is a little bit of hope for the future. Uh, and that is that, uh, you know, science and data will ultimately prevail here. Uh, and unfortunately, this could take many years, it could take a generation. Um, we've seen, you know, the, the discussions and policy debates about other drugs, uh, taking, you know, decades to get to where we are now, and we're still not even close to, to really having this worked out. Um, but, um, this this is an, an excellent excellent podcast. I also wanted to note um, the Mackinac Center uh, regularly uh, looks at um, the data around taxation on tobacco products and how that affects increases or decreases in smuggling. Um, and so this has been updated. Uh, this is a post from 2020, um, which I keep forgetting is two years ago, um, <clears throat> almost two years ago here. Um, but, uh, interestingly, uh, the, the, uh, amount of smuggling in New York has come down a little bit. We've been sort of, uh, trotting out the, the number of 60%, more than 60% of the, uh, cigarettes sold in the state of New York are sold in underground and gray markets. Um, this is, uh, showing that that, that has come down to 53%, but New York is still number one trailed closely by California shouldn't be much of a surprise there. Um, Number one, interestingly, <laughs> another interesting note about their, their analysis, uh, and this is, of course, from 2020. So uh, this is 2018 data, um, and this is pre um, the Evali, the lung injury uh, event that we had in 2019. But Rhode Island, uh, which banned the sales of flavored vape products in response to the lung injuries, um, jumped from 18th place to eighth place uh, in 2018. So uh, things were sort of already uh, going a bad direction there in, in New England um, for cigarette smuggling. And uh, of course, living in New York, I, I've, I've heard complaints from uh, New Hampshire, uh, which is sort of in between uh, uh, states with lower taxes on cigarettes and, and, and smuggled cigarettes coming into Vermont and New York. Um, 
and all of that stuff. So anyway, uh, if you haven't checked out some of the tobacco work that the Mackinac Center has done, um, certainly give it a look. And especially, once again, check out Ms. Michelle Minton's um, uh, podcast here. And I also learned what the Overton window was for policy. There's a, a Wikipedia page on it, which I, oh, I did bring it up here. There's a nice visual representation here of the Overton window um, and, uh, and sort of trying to figure out you know, specifically with with tobacco and nicotine products, um, one of the things that they sort of start off with is that this window is actually very, very narrow. Uh, and a lot of that, I think the boundaries on people's, um, uh, you know, what people will accept in terms of tobacco policy is, is defined by what we all think we know about uh, tobacco companies' involvement in anything having to do with nicotine or tobacco. Uh, and so a lot of people, uh, as we've discussed many times and, um, uh, I, I don't know how deep we got into it on our Twitter space this week, um, but you know, a lot of people are sort of dead set on the, the best policy here is to just punish tobacco companies. Uh, and unfortunately, um, people, activists and the public have not really been given, given the opportunity. Well, the activists are actively uh, distorting the issue. Uh, but the public has really not been given the opportunity to see the the newer the new nicotine product space, the safer nicotine product space, as consumer driven and largely built by people who switched by or, or quit by switching to smoke free nicotine products like vaping. Uh, and so, for the activists, uh, as we've laid out before, and again, as Michelle uh, very clearly articulates in this podcast. Um, you know, a good example is Juul. Uh, you know, Juul is a company that was born out of two people who quit smoking and wanted to share this with the world and develop a product that would be adopted widely by people who smoke. Uh, and instead uh, of being able to do that, certainly mistakes were made, uh, but they have been lumped in with incumbent tobacco companies. Uh, and this was, this was long before Altria took a 35% stake in their company. Um, and so... Uh, you know, the, the conversation has been warped, the nuances and complexity of this have been ignored. And as a result, consumers are ultimately harmed because we lose access to these things. Mm -hmm. All of these points and more are expertly laid out in this podcast. And I highly recommend everybody go and listen to it. And that's my take. Fantastic. Yeah. Huge shout out to Michelle. She's just, I don't uh, know what to add to that. <laughs> yeah, she's a fantastic person. She's uh she's incredible to talk to too. Um, not to plug anything. It's not even available anymore. Years ago, I used to do a podcast uh, of my own, and Michelle was one of the first people that I interviewed. And even though you know I was I was a little younger, a little more naive back then. This really wasn't too long ago. Um, there were kind of points that I had gotten wrong and Michelle's somebody who is, is just happy to educate you. And there was no, like, no Logan, you're dumb. That's wrong. She was just like, you know, actually, uh, here's what I, you know what I mean? And she was really easy to talk to. She's really well informed. Um, this is a podcast I definitely need to listen to. I actually didn't know that this was even a thing. So I'm going to have to go listen to it now. Everybody should go listen to it and shout out to Michelle. Definitely. <laughs> oh. uh, Skip asked if oh, she I'm missed sorry. the link. It, that My link bad. is in our blog, yes? I know. I just, I, the link is in the blog, but I hear it. Hold on. I'm putting it. I'm getting it. I'm just, I was just enthralled in listening to Alex and um, just, oh, you got it. Okay. Yep. And so I, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to put the link in the chat. No worries. <laughs> And so you now it's time for your link in there too, or did you want the what? Yes. The other link in there. What other link? The one for the um, Mackinac new data. Oh, Let's yeah, I can throw one. that in there. Okay, and I will add. Okay, well, mine take today mine take today i can't talk um and i apologize ahead of time i apparently i'm buffering a lot today i am hard lined in i have no idea it could be because my husband's on his xbox i don't know so um i need to get your so husband's gonna... gamer tag now that i know he has an xbox <laughs> um so i was just talking we don't get much chance to talk about other safer alternatives to smoking such as snooze and uh 
um, heat not burn and other things. I mean, even chew is, is safer than smoking, but uh, in a lot of ways. But um, this article popped up and it actually, I think it was a different, I think it was this one that popped up the most recently. What's the date on this one? Um, yeah, February 14th. This came up and he was talking about how um, it says he recently, that Slash from Guns N' Roses recently spoke about giving up on smoking and had advice, um, talking about how hard it is to quit. And then there was a section here where he said, um, he said, and then from that point on, I used the patch and then I used Nicorette and then I was doing snus and then regular gum. I'm still chewing regular gum. And that's been more than 12 years. Um, and I was like, oh, he was doing snus. So I Googled uh, slash and snooze, <laughs> um, and came up with this article from the tobacco reporter, which actually had come out just a few days earlier that somehow I had missed on the 4th of uh, February. And it got a little more into it. And it talked about, um, Alex, say his name for me again. I see it on mm -hmm. Twitter all the time, but I can't pronounce it. I can't read that. It's too small. Oh, it's, it's just a silent G, right? Bent. Bent. Oh, Bink, Binked, Binked Viber. Binked. Binked. All right, my bad. Binked Viber. Don't listen to me. Binked Viber. <laughs> Binked Viber. Okay. I see him all the time. I follow him on Twitter. You guys should follow me on Twitter, too, if you're interested in tobacco harm reduction. He knows a lot about snus. Um, and uh, he was at a Nordic rock station where Slash was, and he asked, um, Hi, Slash. I think it's great that you quit smoking with the help of Swedish snus, and I love it. Or, and love it. Do you support an end the European snooze ban and do you support EU for snooze? And he said, I used to use snooze. I did it for years and years and years. And I finally quit a few years ago. But when I first quit smoking, which is in 2009, pretty soon after that, I discovered snooze. And it was like the best discovery in the world. My God, it's the greatest. I think it's funny that he still thinks it's the greatest. Um, he said, so I did it from probably 2009 to 2015 and something like, or something like that. I used to have general snooze uh, shipped from Sweden. And he, uh, another uh, vaping post did an article about it and actually talked to Binked. <laughs> yep. Binked. Um, and uh, they kind of covered a little bit closer. I think, was this the one that he said it in or no? One of, one of the articles, he, he essentially says that he did it. I think it's this one here. Okay. Um, he had gone to see a share, got a share concert and, um, ended up with pneumonia and that's one of the reasons why I started to quit but he said he used the patch to get the edge off he started doing snooze um and I was doing that for years my significant other talked me out of doing it so I started doing the nicotine gum and I sleep with the gum <laughs> I know that was interesting because it doesn't sound like he was sleeping with the snooze um you have to wonder what the snooze was giving him that the gum doesn't but he um it's interesting that his significant other talked him out of it because you have to think it was probably because she'd heard that it causes oral cancer and all sorts of other problems that, you know, snus does not cause and has been shown after 30 some odd years of research that it does not cause. It, it doesn't it doesn't increase the risk of any known disease. Uh, you'll see a couple studies out there where they'll say something about the uh, pancreatic cancer, but that was a one off thing that has not been duplicated. And um, so they haven't been able to say that it even causes pancreatic cancer. So um, it really has no risks that anybody is aware of. And it has severely, or uh, not severely, uh, greatly reduced smoking in Sweden. And the EU banned it years ago and still won't let people sell it. Uh, Britain's, the UK uh, is looking into possibly selling it again now that they're not in the EU anymore, but the people are fighting it. Um, which makes no sense either. But I think it's really interesting that there's still so much inf misinformation out there around snus. Uh, you have to wonder if he had to sleep with the gum because what if he had just stuck with the snus? Um, you know, maybe she just didn't like him having it in his mouth. I don't know. Here's a, the Casas page on smokeless tobacco, which uh, I welcome you guys to check out. I don't know if uh, um, Logan's dropping those links in there for me or not. Um, oh, yes, chat. absolutely. <laughs> Were you forgetting? Uh, but this talks about what snus is and and all other um, smokeless options as well and, and how it can work and different cautions and, you know, about answers common questions about whether or not it causes cancer. Um, so I highly recommend that you check that out. Uh, I often tell the story about how my husband 
couldn't quit with vaping right away. Uh, he, he found that there was something, just something missing and just adding the snooze to the, the vaping was what finally took for him to be able to not have that one or two cigarettes every once in a while. And, um, has made the difference. And to this day, he still snooses. And, and I was the same thing as, as slash his significant other. I, when he first said, well, you know, we, we were doing everything. We were adding extra menthol. We had the nicotine up to like, I don't even know how high it was. It, it was very high. And, um, he just, he just couldn't, he's like, something's missing. Something's missing. And, he, and he's the one who told me about snooze. And I was like, oh no, no, that's, that's, that's smokeless tobacco. That'll give you mouth cancer. You're just, you're just trading lung cancer for mouth cancer and you're gonna lose half your face. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought it all. And, you know, this was, this was very early. This was about 2010. So I was just getting into uh, vaping because I had started vaping in September of 2009. Um, and I, I went on to the e-cigarette forum and found that there was a snooze forum and learned a whole lot about snooze and realized that this is another one of those things that tobacco control has had decades of practice on to use and switch it over to vaping. You know, all the same things that you see them doing, all the, the, the underhanded half truth, outright lies, scaremongering, all of that stuff, they've been doing it with snooze. Um, and that, and that's why they're just so good at it. Uh, but it really makes no sense for snooze to, you know, continuum of risk, something that, that Gottlieb even talked about something that other higher ups in our government in the U S here have talked about, but they just can't make that extra, take that next step to really admitting that it's a difference. They just still want to, there's, there's these little bits of risk. There's these little bits of, you know, and then they just come up every, every single thing just gets blown out of proportion with vaping. Um, and that's the same thing they do with snooze. There, there, there's, I hate to use the word literally, but there's literally nothing that, that they have found that snooze increases the risk of any diseases. And, um, it's like using coffee or tea or anything like that. I mean, it's more proven than vaping is. I think vapors really need to understand this, that it is more, it, it, the science is much more, um, solid on snooze. And so when you can't, that's why you can't just lump everything in. And that's why it bugs me when people say, well, vaping's not tobacco. There's no tobacco in it. It's the tobacco that makes it, that makes it bad. And it's like, no, it's the smoke. It's the smoke, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so it's really snooze important. Has been for around since the the seventies, I believe in, in hundreds, no, 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 hundreds well, before of years. That, yeah, before that. Hundreds of years. Yeah. But mo modern was, snoops, I mean, like right? Like in, was going out into it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the standards by which snooze is made, um, the Gothia tech, uh, standard, which is more like food standards. Um, I, I don't know how old that is, but that's been around for a while. I mean, snooze is such a, such a big part. We've said this before. Snooze is such a big part of Sweden's identity that uh, in order for Sweden to join the EU, they they had to get assurances that that they would not have to ban snus like the rest of, of the European right. Union. Um, and yeah, so it's it's at least in the the form of of, of loose snus uh, has been around for 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 hundreds of years. Right. Right. Um, and then the the, pou the pouches are certainly a, a modern uh, development. Yeah, that, that's but, what I, I was fundamentally to, snus though. has been around for a very long time. Right. And yeah, that the... that what what Kristen was saying about sort of, you know, the research around snooze being more robust um, is really just a function of time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as we go forward with vaping, I, I, I have little doubt and, and all of the other experts have very little doubt that, um, you know, I think the, 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 the data is going to be very similar. Um, the only, the, the real added risk of vaping is the fact that it involves your lungs uh, and, okay. and that you don't have that with snooze. Um, but the risk between the two products is, is negligible. Yeah. But that, and that's, but that, unfortunately that's what really concerns me too, is that you will see you here. We have 30 years of data showing the safety of this product and they still have it banned and they still deny it. And it just makes me just so afraid that what are they going to do with, you know, how long is it going to be with vaping? You know? And so, so some people who are thinking, well, let the science speak for itself. Let the science speak for yourself. It's not really about that. It's got to be our personal stories. It's, we've got to show a lot more than that. Because if if snooze with all of that scientific evidence behind it is still banned, you we've got a big hill ahead of us 
uh, you know, as vaping advocates, I mean, we're not just vaping advocates, but if you're a vaping advocate, um, you need to understand that you're not in a bubble. You're not in an island. There's a lot of other things that have been going on in this world that you can learn from and realize that we're on the same side of a lot of other people that you may not, that you may still be repeating those anti-tobacco myths and lies unintended, you know, unintentionally because you're saying things like, well, tobacco is what's bad. Tobacco's got bad things in it. It's the tobacco. And you have to remember it's the smoke. It's not the tobacco. And it is a valid way to quit smoking. It's worked in Sweden. You'll hear from the UK and from the US and Canada saying things like, well, Sweden's different. Somehow, apparently they're different it's not. bodies or something. I don't know. <laughs> Sweden's must be, you know, the Swedes must be aliens. I don't, I, I don't know what they mean by that because well, it's a cultural thing. It doesn't mean anything. You know, we didn't have nicotine gum 40 years ago either, but people don't have a problem using it to quit smoking. So it's just, it's just a ridiculous claim. But so keep that in mind, you know, if you like guns and roses, maybe in, in, you're, you're having problems with, uh, with vaping or getting vapor products, you know, Slash liked it. So maybe you can try that too. <laughs> if you think it'll work and help you. Alex might know. I don't know where correct. I was going with this, but I, I just correct wanted to if, talk about snooze. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the, uh, I guess the prevalence of use amongst men in Sweden is, is relatively high. Right. For, for snooze. Um, it's, it's much lower for women, I believe. Um, in in sweden but there's there's a, a large percentage of men who use snooze and then to like kind of on the other side of that coin their cancer rates in sweden are extremely low compared to the rest of the eu yeah right, right. as far as i mean across the board tobacco related illness in sweden is lower than the rest of the eu uh, and right. that is largely being attributed to the fact that right. snooze is legal there. Um, but to answer your question, and I'll, I'll pick up Green Eyed Lady's question here uh, about whether or not when you use snooze, do you have to spit? No, you don't. Um, snooze is uh, pasteurized, unlike American moist snuff, which is uh, fermented. Uh, and so it doesn't upset your stomach like American moist snuff. Uh, there is no there is no spitting involved. Um, probably if, if there is anything um, that might be unsettling. And, and you'll see me when I flash my snoozy smile uh, is that, you know, it, it does temporarily, the tobacco juice does, does brown your teeth, um, but it's not a lasting stain. Uh, I am not by any stretch of the imagination, the model of oral health. Um, but when I do brush my teeth, uh, it, it, it disappears. Uh, my, my teeth are mainly stained because of coffee. Uh, and and, yeah, and mine too. I, I don't, I, I don't have any extra like you know. I, I'm sure there's some mine people too. out there who 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 probably use more snooze than I do, and they may have stains on their teeth. But all of that to say, uh, I think for for women adopting uh, snooze, some of this has to do with those uh, you know temporary cosmetic issues, uh, but also you know some of the work that that well the reason why Bing de Weiberg is is a part of this whole conversation uh, is because. He has been inspired to create um, what is called sting-free snooze uh, and specifically targeting par targeting women. And this was inspired by, I believe it was his wife who uh, was still smoking and, and didn't want to switch to snooze because she didn't like the sting. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it really, I mean, this is not a gender specific thing. Honestly, if you don't like the sting of, of an oral tobacco product, then um, hopefully in, in the coming years, I don't, I don't know if his invention, it, it is an invention, um, has been uh, taken up by snooze manufacturers, um, but uh, there are certainly more than one application for this. One of the things that he can do with it is make uh, uh, different flavored snooze. So you can have on one side one flavor, it's separated by this membrane, and then on the other side you have a different flavor, and so you can sort of choose how, what you'd like to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that 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 uh, that has a lot to do with it. Is it you know the, the cosmetic issues um, and uh, and and the general feel of it. In response to that, in addition to uh, people like Bink, who, who have invented something to make the product more palatable to the wider audience, um, nicotine pouches uh, are, are a great thing uh, for, for people who, who don't want to deal with that appearance of, of, of brown on your teeth. Um, 
the, the sting is not nearly as intense as what you get from from regular tobacco snus. Um, and is they it like the are, gum or the lozenges? Because for those, you're supposed even, to I mean, do the, the gum, same thing. I mean, you do the same thing. Yeah, you tuck it into your cheek. So, I mean. The, the, yeah, it, it depends, I think, on the flavor and the brand and the nicotine content as far as nicotine pouches go. You get a little bit of that that peppery sting, um, but it's, it, you know, the gum is different. I, I wouldn't compare um, oral tobacco to gum in terms of like the sensation. Um, just that it's just my experience. Um, I, I it, they, you know, what they describe is that peppery sensation, which right. doesn't really have that sort of enduring sting. Like I can feel it now I've got, you know, a snooze pouch in and, and I can feel it's, it's like a, it's a really tiny kind of burn, uh, just lets me know that it's there and it's doing its thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, there are more and more options available to, uh, really anyone, I hate making this gender specific, but I guess we have to acknowledge that women certainly have different tastes than men, uh, and, and, and different priorities for sure. Uh, and so, um, there are options out there. I would love to see, you know, everybody being able to adopt a smoke free option. Uh, and snooze is certainly one of those things, even if you vape, you know, when you travel, when, when people travel this, I mean, this is how I got introduced to snooze was spending a lot of time on public transportation. Uh, and I needed a smoke free option that was not nicotine gum uh, that I could use on flights and, and, and trains and buses. Uh, and so there are a lot of people out there who vape that will use snooze or nicotine pouches when they fly. Um, and that's that's a great way to you know get introduced to the product and and um, uh, and use it instead of cigarettes. And uh, it's certainly in a pinch uh, nowadays, depending on where you live, you can probably find snooze in more convenience stores than you'll be able to find a vapor product. Uh, and so if people shouldn't, don't be afraid of it. It's, it's not, you know, oral tobacco generally is not, does not live up to, uh, the hysteria that was promoted in the, in the eighties, uh, the, all the pictures of people with these horrible oral cancers and missing their faces. Um, you know, some of that is attributable to smoking. Probably more of it is, I, I believe, according to the numbers, smoking and binge drinking puts you at more risk of developing oral and esophageal cancer than uh, than using smokeless tobacco generally, whether it's snooze or even chew. Uh, and, and arguably the biggest concern with chew uh, is the sugar that's used to cure the product and flavor it, uh, causing uh, uh, dental problems, tooth decay, gum loss and all yeah. that. And you see um, that yeah. a lot. They'll use that. They'll use that dental. They'll say, oh, it ruins your teeth. But the thing is, is anything, if you're not properly brushing and if you're doing something that you're, you're washing your mouth with something, you know, or, or putting something in your mouth that's, that's known to do that sort of thing. If you drink a ton of soda, you know, if you um, eat a lot of sugary stuff. I mean, I noticed my, my gums and my tooth health got a lot better once I went low carb, you know, I mean, it made a huge difference because I did, wasn't eating all that stuff that had sugar to, to feed the bacteria that we all have in our mouths, you know? So, so same thing with, you're going to, if you're going to tuck something in your mouth and it doesn't matter if it's a packet of snooze or a piece of nicotine gum, if you've got something sitting there, it's going to irritate that right there or wherever you put it, it's going to sit there and it's going to kind of irritate that. And if you constantly keep putting things in the same spot, you may end up with some kind of, um, you know, cyst or something that, you know, uh, I'm, just, I'm yeah. totally blanking on the word. I don't want to say tumor. It's not tumor. It's another word, but um, like yeah. So I mean, um, you move it, make sure you're moving it around, you know, don't put it in the same spot. Sorry. My understanding that of that. Um, when it comes to yeah american um like alex was talking about particularly like american dip chew real sweet real sugary um not so the yeah. dip not dip the chew chew and people we we sort of again this is like i'm real know, bad at this one too yeah this I is like this people using time. using the word decimated wrong um yeah chew chew is one type of tobacco Sorry. dip or american moist snuff is another type um, you know, chew is a longer cut. It's a coarser cut. You do put a wad of it in your cheek and you do chew it to get the flavor, the nicotine, the juices, all that stuff. Dip, it goes in your lower lip um, and, and you don't, you still have to spit, but you don't chew it. Um, right. So I, I, I've heard people use chew sort of interchangeably just to describe all oral tobacco, but it is its own category. It is its own category. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's one of the few things where I, I still I mix the two and I, I, I need to break that habit. Um, 
but yeah, definitely the sugar no content, you know, brushing your teeth, um, you know, cleaning good, good oral, uh, care. Um, but like, um, Kristen was talking about that repetitive, repetitive in the same place, especially, uh, with, with rough cut, uh, tobacco damaging that soft tissue, irritating it, um, damaging that soft tissue over and over and over, uh, can lead to problems and a, and a great, way to reduce your risk is to just mix it up mix up where you where you put it you know give those areas time to heal um as opposed That's, to kind of the, the same place over and over yeah we 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 every time we talk about uh snus or other oral tobacco products we always mention brad radu um and and his work in this area and um one of the things that he has said is you know this the scare one of the scares about using smokeless tobacco is developing leukoplakia uh, which is kind of like a it's a white sort of callus in your mouth mm -hmm. and that's it uh you know the researchers have claimed or or there i somebody has produced studies to show that that's sort of like a precancerous pre thing. It's a indication that, yeah. that cancer is developing uh it's that's not the case it, it's mm -hmm. it's a it's basically a callus and the way to fix that as you mentioned logan is to just move it to a different spot and you know i have used it someone this is steve Toddenham mentioned canker sores. I don't know if this was in response to, to things that people experience oh, using smokeless me tobacco. Trying to, no, me trying to think of the word of the stuff that can oh, okay, up okay. in your mouth, I think. Like abscesses, but, canker you know, sores. One of the really interesting things that happened to me, and, and I, it, it took me a while to, to hear somebody actually explain that this was a thing. When I first switched from smoking to vaping, I got a lot of canker sores in my mouth. Uh, at the time, of course, I actually started going to the dentist at the same time. I had to get some work done, uh, but I was also eating uh, sharp snacks like chips and stuff. Mm. Uh, and so would, and, and I, I have a problem sometimes just getting a little too involved with what I'm eating and I, I'll bite my cheek. And so in those like first like six months when I transitioned, I would get canker sores in my mouth really easily. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite know what was going on, um, but just sort of rolled with the punches. And eventually it stopped. And, and what I came to learn was that when we quit smoking, the blood flow returns to our mouth in, mm -hmm. in you know, a normal way. So, you know, exposing all of the tissues in your mouth to smoke for however many years starts constricting that blood flow. And uh, when it comes mm -hmm. back, that's our bodies, you know, our bodies aren't, aren't used to it. And so any little tiny nick or cut inside there will develop into a canker sore. Um, but I, I huh. never, I never experienced that from using smokeless. Um, and again, it's, it's really a matter of just using sharp things. So when I use um, American moist snuff, uh, which can have some sharp pieces in it, um, you know, that gets a little bit uncomfortable, but it, it goes away. Uh, and and I, I, I it, it, if there is anything to be concerned about, um, you know, long cut uh, or or the cut of tobacco that you would use in an oral product, uh, it's going to be a repeated injury. Uh, repeated injuries can develop into something that's cancerous, um, but that's yeah. not necessarily something that's not coming from the tobacco itself. Uh, just don't right. stab yourself in the mouth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, yeah. that 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 damaging of the soft tissue over and over again uh, can definitely lead to problems. And, but again, the, the easiest solution here is to mix up, you know, where you, where you dip, where you're placing your product in your mouth and, and giving those other areas time to heal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like we could have done a deep dive on this. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we, we, this was, this was one of the proposals for doing the deep dive and, yeah. and we're going to do something else, but um, I, I do think, you know, Kristen, you're right. I, I think, you know, we spend a lot of our time focused on vaping because that's what's in the news. Um, but, you know, it is also part of our mission to make sure people are aware of and reminded repeatedly that there are other smoke free products that are out there. And, you know, as your, your husband experienced, you know, vaping isn't going to work for a lot for everybody. Uh, and so they should be aware of the other safer alternatives like snooze and, and even, yes, American moist smokeless. Yeah. yeah. And the history I, um, behind I, it. Yeah. Because I think it's important I've, to know that history behind it and how that's affecting us in vaping and how it could affect us who vape. Because, you know, we may think, oh, we just need to get them enough science. And even with snooze after 30 years. So, you know, it, it's yeah. going to take a multi pronged approach to get this, you know, to, to keep fighting this, really. 
And I, and Tom, uh, more, more wets, more vets is yeah, asking I was some to, questions I was here. Skip's question first. Um, Squip, Skip, I would say smoke free tobacco or oral tobacco. I think yeah, is what and, I would say. So, is a, you know, because she's asking what's a good general term. I don't smokeless. I think still has more of a negative connotation, but um, honestly, I think. I, I think any of the, I like the oral tobacco suggestion broadly, uh, right. for the whole entire category. Um, but as I was going to, one of the things I wanted to say was, um, you know, this all started in the eighties, as I mentioned. Uh, and this is one of my sort of beefs with tobacco control. Uh, and, and I've talked about this before, you know, in, in, in trying to give some deference to tobacco control in, 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 you know, pursuing strategies and using tools that were available at the time to go after tobacco companies that were uh, deceiving the public. And in some parts of the world, they continued to deceive the public about the health risks of smoking. Uh, and, and, you know, that was that was warranted. Um, yes, I saw the Bengals lost, uh, whatever. It was a good game. <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to kind of square this circle of giving deference to the tobacco control community when in the eighties, there was certainly data available about snus. Uh, there was certainly data available about smokeless tobacco use and the low risk compared to smoking. And instead of highlighting that, instead of pursuing a harm reduction strategy that could have benefited millions of more people, there are millions of people who died early because of the decision by tobacco control to lump all tobacco products in with cigarettes. The statement that there is no safe tobacco use is arguably true, but horribly misleading uh, and does not account for the continuum of risk. Uh, and so when we do start to talk about uh, Tom's Tom Morowitz's question here about does smokeless tobacco carry any negative overtones like nicotine causes cancer, it carries that because that was done intentionally in the 80s to mislead the public and tell this massive white lie, crossing our fingers and hoping that people would just abandon tobacco altogether. Well, as we now know, 40 years later, uh, number one, that doesn't happen with any drug. And number two, it definitely didn't happen with tobacco. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they just continue to mislead people and, and seize on opportunities like a bunch of lung injuries in 2019 to continue scaring the pants off of people to think that all nicotine products are evil. Uh, and that it's, a, it's like, a, it's just a death sentence, um, which is just absolutely misleading. And I think ultimately it ignores the history, the continuum of history, risk. History books will show that this is this has harmed their their cause, uh, and and more could have been achieved in a, in a much shorter time frame had we just all been telling the truth. Yeah, and it's not just yeah. cigarettes. I mean, I'll just this is the last thing I'll say, but the about it is that they it wasn't just that they compared it to cigarettes; it's that they took they they purposely focused on studies that were of people using an Indian style uh, tobacco mix that's mixed with the uh, betel nut, I think it's called, or the Keisha nut. There's um, slaked lime, betel slaked quid. Slaked lime. And then yeah. there's a little bit of tobacco thrown in it and they call that tobacco there, which is really weird. Um, but because uh, people chew just the betel nut or the acacia nut or however you say that, um, and that's it's highly carcinogenic. I can't even say that word. Carcin um, carcin but it, you know they've shown that it just by, by itself it's got. A, now you're throwing me off, Alex. Um, Sorry. But it, it, they've shown that just the nut itself, <clears throat> the nut, you know, those two nuts themselves can cause no nut bitties. Um, it's a chew. Uh, they that those things, I'm sorry, that was well, glee babes. Um, but the, the thing is, is that they've shown that those things by themselves are, ha, you know, can cause cancer. And then they add a little bit of tobacco to it and they blame the, the tobacco. I mean, it's really weird, but anyhow, those studies show that there was a high incidence of, um, of oral cancer. And if you looked at any of these studies that they would say, well, oh, chew tobacco, you know, chewing tobacco that causes oral cancer. You know, it's, it's, it's established. It's well known. It's going to give you, you know, oral cancer. But then you look at the studies they cite and it's stuff from India or uh, Malaysia okay. or wherever there's, these there's, things are popular. Well, and then on top of that, there's there's this, one study that that uh, that is it is not included in here, but it should be um, as far as America is concerned. Uh, the, 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 the study that really started all of the misinformation here was um, uh, uh, research on uh, Southern women 
who right, use... I was good to that. <laughs> they, oh, okay. Well, I, you kept saying <laughs> India, and I was like, well, wait, no, no, there's this other thing. That's I was about to say, space. yeah, I was going to say, and the other thing that they used was the was the powdered stuff that they put up their nose in, in the South that was limited to a very small group of people, um, Southern women and older Southern women too. I mean, I don't think there was a lot of younger Southern women doing that by that point. But but again, it's kind of like the secondhand smoke thing that was very specific to a, to a very specific, I, I don't know if you call it cohort or, or population, population of, you know, a population of women living specifically with men who were heavy smokers for decades and decades and decades. And then they just, just kind of extrapolated that and said, oh, all secondhand smoke. Well, that's what the same thing that they did with chew and, and oral tobacco or smoke-free tobacco, whatever you want to call it. Um, they took a study from India, you know, studies from India showing that this stuff that's mixed with the, you know, a highly cancerous nut caused oral cancer and then snuff, you know, powdered snuff in a small group in the South and said, oh, look, had neck cancers. And then they extrapolated and said, all chew does that, nothing safe. And, you know, snooze got rolled up into that too. So, who this went really long and we haven't even started with our, <laughs> this could, I could, we could talk about this for a long time. I probably should have held off and done this for a, for a deep dive, but uh, one of these, one we'll of call, these days, we'll call this a mini dive instead one, of a take. This one was one a of these dive. days we need to have a, a, you know, Brad Radu or, or Bing to come on. Um, oh, some, of the, awesome. some of the snooze folks We'll we'll have a snooze and oral tobacco guest on. Uh, and, we and we'll devote that. certainly the, at least the last 30 minutes to to talking with them and, and learning, right. benefiting from their expertise. I yeah. can still learn. Yeah. You guys can learn. Our yeah. audience can learn for sure. So but anyhow, yeah, we can have, we can have oral tobacco day. <laughs> Bring your oral tobacco to school. Day. No, don't, don't, don't do that. No, don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> Shallow dive. I think we've done one of those before. I think we've, we've used that, <laughs> that term in the past uh, when, when we were limited on time. Yeah, shallow dive, mini dive. Um, right. Okay, so yeah, I mean, but you know, this I don't have much. To it's add all about here the nicotine, than, right? So yeah, I don't have much to add here other than I use I use uh, both products, pouches and and snooze, um, on top of vaping uh, when I'm working in places that where I can't vape if I'm on long rides, things like that. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of both. Uh, the only thing I, I I guess I wish the more commercially available, readily available nicotine pouches came in slightly higher milligram, um, which is is when I tend to to use snooze if I want something a little more with a little more punch to it. Um, just because the nicotine pouches that are out, while they're fantastic and they're 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 good and they come in you know nice flavors and things like that, tend to be a, a little bit lower in the milligram than what you're going to find in in snooze. But yeah. All right. Are you are you ready? Are we ready? <laughs> I'm ready. An hour and 17 minutes in to do our deep dive. Yeah, let's Sorry. do it. Okay, let's do it. Kristen, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to get yelled at again. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. I must have just been glitching when you said it last time, and that's why I did that. But yeah, I heard Alex go, "Let's do it on the on the take," and I, I and I, I must have glitched. Smash that it. button. <laughs> I just heard. I heard. Are you ready? And then you did it. And I was like, "Oh," but I probably just glitched. My stupid. All right. Technique. So, how deep are we I diving? Like what are we diving into? Well, Kristen, this was your your topic. So why don't you lead us off here? Oh. Oh, I see how that works. Only because you guys yeah. couldn't come up with anything this week. <laughs> well, I'm all I'm I'm well as we established in the pre-show. I'm just winging it and talking about personal experience, <laughs> and and you are the one who comes through all of this research. So I figure it is appropriate oh, that you okay, have the. Okay, so floor. where where am I on this? Let me find my. I got to get rid of this stuff. Hold on, because I need to. It's not good for me to do this. Go straight in from my um. I think I'll use Jim's article. Um, so one of the things that we always see is uh, is people saying that the only reason people smoke or use uh, products that contain nicotine is because of the nicotine, that they they get addicted and then they just can't quit. And the only thing keeping them still using it is the fact that they have withdrawal symptoms. Um, from trying to quit and that's what gets them back to doing it. And other than that, there's no other reason that anybody would want to use nicotine. 
So I thought, you know, it'd be a good thing to maybe talk about things that are a good argument for why nicotine can actually be a benefit. Um, and I'm not talking about a benefit that it's going to save the world benefit, um, you know, unless unless it's a world leader having nicotine fit if it's possible but um, other than that um but what i mean is you know <laughs> how cocky you what um, sorry i just how, i just had this image in my head of like a, a world leader with like their finger over the nuke button or something like get this person oh, some nicotine before he loses yeah, could it you imagine, like, could you imagine could you imagine i'm, I'm sorry i just it was funny the image in my head was funny yeah Nukes aren't funny carry on that's okay that's what i meant you know <laughs> I mean, Obama was, you know, he was trying to quit smoking. So who knows what would have happened if he hadn't had his nicotine gum, right? Um, and just had, you know, pitched a fit or whatever. Uh, so, but there are some some big things it can do. And there's some small things, you know, on a small scale, it's things that, you know, how maybe a glass of wine might make somebody feel at the end of a stressful day or how somebody might focus better because they have some coffee. You know, it's it's those little things in life type of things that nicotine can can be very similar um, and, and those other things get a pass, their, their risks get a pass because they, um, they, they're not, they're not like smoking, which can, can really increase, you know, it's the delivery mechanism, like we had in the discussion last time. So, so there are some, you know, I like to talk about that too, about, you know, maybe get into how we feel like nicotine helps us. And, you know, I'd love to have the chat kind of pipe up and say what they think that nicotine helps them with. Um, and in you know, Jim's article here and, uh, I'll have to pop this into the um, the chat. I will pop these things in the chat after I'm done talking. Um, and it will be also in the description after the show. But, uh, you know, here Jim, Jim's talking about, you know, how people would be surprised to learn that the majority of Americans believe that uh, uh, nicotine causes cancer and um, that it doesn't cause cancer. And they also could be a breakthrough treatment for uh neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, or it may help unlock mysteries of schizophrenia or be used to create new weight loss therapies. Um, now we're talking about Alzheimer's. That one, I think since he wrote this article is kind of flip flop that it, it doesn't help with Alzheimer's the same way it helps with Parkinson's. Um, so he talks about how, how they use it to treat Parkinson's disease. They don't use it yet. They're really looking into it because they've noticed that people who smoke have a lower incident rate of Parkinson's. Um, and I, there is a study, and I will put the study in the link as well, that uh, talks about uh, Parkinson's. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, and uh, just to talk about what he's saying, um, that this article here talks about, he says, well, one of the authors says it has been proposed that people with Parkinsonian risk probably discover empirically that nicotine suppresses early onset tremors and begin to self-medicate with tobacco, thus preventing or delaying the onset of, onset of this disease. Research from other groups has associated nicotine with protective and or preventative effects against Parkinsonian symptoms. Uh, similar protective effects have been observed in mammalian models where, I can't say this word, uh, dice dyxenias are suppressed by nicotine. Um, that was too technical for me to understand. I do read a lot of, I mean, I read a lot of these things, but I don't always understand everything I'm reading. I do a lot of Googling of words, um, but they're basically, so they're looking into why does it seem like, and it's kind of similar with the whole thing with the smoking and COVID is like, why does it seem like they don't, uh, people who were smoking or vaping didn't seem to get COVID as much. Um, it makes sense why if they did get it, it could hit them harder because of with smoking with what, you know, the, the, your lungs just aren't in tip top shape. Um, but same thing with Parkinson's, they've noticed that people who, uh, who smoke just had either it's, it's pushed back. They get it when they're a lot older or it really helps keep their, um, keeps it. And here, there's a whole video on here showing how it looks like this person's actually using a vape product of some kind. I didn't even watch this video when I pulled this up. Um, <laughs> but uh, how it can help with the tremors and the shaking, if you think about Michael J. Fox. Um, and uh, he also talks about uh, so snooze. Um, nicotine is a cognitive enhancer, uh, being neuroprotective and uh, 
I don't know if I got into this, this problem, uh, whether or not it can help you burn fat. And that goes back and forth to CPO. It's not a good weight loss thing. It is a good weight loss thing. People put on uh, weight after they, um, they quit using it. Um, I know a lot of people, especially with vaping and the different flavors, have said they've given up a lot of sweets that they used to um, have. And in all honesty, you don't necessarily need the nicotine for that. You know, so vaping kind of has that advantage as well with that. Um, improving short-term memory. Uh, another, and, and, and ADHD, another study that I came up with, I will pop this one up um, if I can find it, was nicotine as therapy. And this one I found really interesting, and, and you guys should really look at this one. This one was from, um, I want to say 2004. Yeah, 2004. And she basically does the same thing that Jim does in his article. And again, I will share that. Um, it says a cheap, common, and mostly safe drug in daily use for centuries by hundreds of millions of people that only lately has been investigated for its therapeutic potential from a long list of common ills. Now remember, this is from 2004. Uh, that list includes Alzheimer's disease, which has kind of gotten excluded and there's not, so they're not as sure, but Parkinson's disease for sure, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and ADHD, even pain, pain and obesity. Uh, and they're asking why uh, has interest in this potential cure all been slow to develop? One reason it's current forms. The drug offers pharmaceutical companies no possibility of substantial profit. Hmm, interesting. Another, perhaps more important, the drug is reviled as the world's most addictive. The drug, of course, is nicotine. And if you think about it, this was written back in 2004 when we really didn't have vaping. Um, but we did have snooze. Uh, <laughs> so she goes, she, I want to say she, I want to make sure I get this. Yeah, Tabitha. Goes into talking about, you know, where nicotine came from and uh, how, I think they, she even mentions the Native Americans, um, higher doses are toxic, uh, how it locks onto different receptors uh, in the brain. And, you know, interestingly, things like depressive spectrum disorders, schizophrenia and adult age ADHD, you think about people with depression, uh, you think people under very high stress, those are people who tend to smoke a lot. You're talking about people, low incomes. Okay, well, is it because, you know, and, they, they, and I really hate how they always throw together, well, the people who do this, they're, they're lower income and less educated. And they make that seem like that's the reason people smoke. You know, that, oh, they're just dumb is what it, that makes it sound like. It, it really does. Or they're poor and dumb, you know, so even worse, poor people. <laughs> or that those are a result of using tobacco. Or it's the result, right? And and they never stop and think, okay. And this is what kind of what I wanted to get into when we talk about our own personal stories as to why people use nicotine, because I've made this point many times before. Of you know, I think it's something like sixty-five or eighty. It might even be more than that. A percent of people have tried smoking at some time in their life, and not nowhere near that number gets addicted or dependent or goes back to use. A lot of people will try a cigarette and never try one again. Um, same thing with the vaping. And we're seeing that with the vaping, this, this, you know, that huge number of millions of kids who in 2018 and 2019 at the height of the um, vaping epidemic, okay, well, years later, we're not seeing that translate into a bunch of addicted kids and smoking rates going up and vaping rates higher between 18 and 24. It's just not translating. So it's not an immediately, and we've talked about this with drugs too, there's no drug that's immediately addictive. Um, or, or habit forming or, or dependency forming. Um, and so what I found was interesting was that, uh, that the, the, pe the people go back to use it. They, somebody has a cigarette and goes, wow, that made me feel really good. In spite of the fact that I'm hacking a lung up right now, because I remember my first cigarette. Oh, <laughs> um, so I feel like there's something in this whole thing with the nicotine in the brain that, that effect is not, there's something going on there. It's your people aren't immediately being hooked on it from just the nicotine. Uh, just my husband having nicotine, you know, just the fact that nicotine patches don't always, you know, that they have a dismal record. Nicotine gum is a dismal record. Uh, even vaping kind of has not the greatest record. I mean, it's a lot better than the other ones because I think it addresses the habit thing of the, the hand mouth and the whole uh, uh, experience. But just the nicotine alone for people like my husband, there was something missing. And I think a lot of that has to do with the different mood things, you know, the other um, MAO, MAOI, MAOIs, um, the, uh, the, uh, and the nicotine also, which is one, um, just how it makes you feel 
beyond just trying to satisfy the urge because of a dependency, if that makes any sense. Um, and the fact, and one of the things that they talked about in here, I'm trying to see if it says it right here. It says, but it came across in this, in this, um, in this study, she said, people with depressive spectrum disorders, schizophrenia and adult ADHD tend to smoke heavily, which suggested to researchers that nicotine may soothe their symptoms. Um, and that begs the question to me, tobacco control wants, you know, that they often roll, you know, these people out that people who, who have, um, you know, uh, depressive spectrum disorders, schizophrenia, adult ADHD, uh, suffer from other kinds of depressions, uh, people under a lot of stress in their lives. People, you know, there's a reason why people who are lower income might want to have a cigarette and have that be their one treat, their one, their one, uh, what would you call it? Luxury, you know, that they spend on themselves that, they can't, you know, they're not taking, they're not going to Barbados twice a year, you know, I mean, they have, a lot of times they have crap jobs, they live in dangerous neighborhoods, they have all these things happening to them in their lives that, that are going to affect their stress level and affect their emotion and, and are, and are going to make them feel a certain way. Uh, same thing with LGBTQ, you know, they, they have very stressful lives that, you know, they have family who have walked away from them or, or rejected them. They have, they have a lot of their own, you know, issues as far as that. There's a lot of, they'll say, them, they'll tell you, there's a lot of emotional stress from that, um, from being a part of that community, not from the community itself, but I mean, from the outside world to that community uh, that could increase stress for them. Um, especially, you know, when they're coming up through uh, adolescents and teens that I think a lot of them start in that stage because there's just so much prejudice and so much being thrown at them, you know? Um, and so you have to wonder, tobacco control wants to flip that script and say, well, all these groups, all these groups have, who have so much stress in their lives, they all have a higher, you know, African-Americans, that's the other thing with the menthol, you know, they, they all have all this stuff going on in their lives, or I'm sorry, they have, they, these groups all smoke and they have a higher risk of smoking and higher incidence of smoking. So we need to focus on them to get them to stop smoking. But the thing that they don't say is they don't look at this kind of study and say these people are might be getting something from that smoking. So if you take that away, where are you going to leave them? What are you going to give them to replace that that comfort, that thing that you that they're using? What are you going to give them back that is going to do serve the same function? I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, um, and then the last thing that I found I found this really interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, ultra alternative colitis there's a there's this i liked this um i've often used this one in the past that uh and i'm almost done um that talks about uh using nicotine nicotine treatment because they found that uh because it's an inflammatory bowel disease and that smoking appears to sort of do something that protects against it um and protects against the risk of developing it but what i found was really interesting down here is they say, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. I wish there was a way to like mark things. Oh, here it is. Um, okay. On the whole, transdermal nicotine treatment results in frequent side effects. Okay. So that's the patch. Um, although most patients are able to complete the course of therapy, no withdrawal symptoms suggesting nicotine addiction have been reported either for either after four to six weeks of therapy in short-term studies, or even after a period of up to six months in the long, in the only long-term study available. Clearly alternative nicotine formulations uh, able to minimize the adverse effect of patches are of interest. Oh gee, I wonder what they could use instead of a patch. Um, but but that, that's that whole thing about, you know, all, nicotine is so addictive, it's so horrible. Well, here's people who are using it for not to quit smoking, who weren't already addicted to nicotine uh, or dependent on nicotine. I hate using addicted, but who weren't using nicotine and they were using uh, pat, you know, amounts that a person who smokes would have to use to quit smoking because they were using patches um, and they didn't get dependent on it. So it kind of blows out of the water so here it's being both therapeutic and not addictive, which I thought I, I've always liked that the study for that. And again, I will share this. And then the final one I came across was this one. 
And you guys will know if you've heard the story about my daughter um, that, uh, and I'm sorry, this is, this is a, this is a um, shop, but, I, but when I was Googling it, I came across this. Um, she said that vaping saved her from self-harm. She's a mother of five children, ages 12, 11, eight, and seven, and six. She's got severe anxiety and chronic depression. About a year ago, I was put on very heavy antidepressant medications. I couldn't deal with my children. I found it difficult to cook and clean and just function all together. I could barely shower some days. I had tried therapy, and while I felt all right during my sessions, as soon as I left, it was pointless. I was right back to where I was when I had arrived. Doctors had me try numerous different prescriptions. All I had, all have very bad side effects, whether it made me a mombi, a zombie mom, or caused me to have a man have manic episodes. The Xanax made it so bad that one night I had let my two oldest go to a friend's house after school. They were only an hour getting home, but I completely crumpled thinking I had gotten my daughter's kidnapped. Oh God, poor lady. I missed that part when I first read this. All right. So she started weaning herself off these medications after that. It was painful. She started vaping to help combat the anxiety and shaking. Vaping helped me from my self-harm and helped me become a better mother. I've been vaping for around seven months. I am medication free. So nicotine for her replaced all that other stuff that doctors were throwing at her. Um, and I think that's the last thing that I have as far as a visual. So I'll take this down. Um, and, and you know the story that I've often told about my daughter who was, again, I have permission from her to ask that she, to tell the story. Uh, and she, she's 20 now, but she was cutting. Um, and she was other things. She had weird relationships with food and stuff like that. Um, and she had started smoking and even this is just a couple of years ago, even with me being, you know, all the, me constantly talking about, you know, not smoking and vaping and having brothers and, you know, who vaped and, um, and we ultimately had to pull her out of school because she was just having so much trouble. She, you know, just some stuff from earlier in her life uh, before we got custody of her has, has caused some issues. And um, so what we ultimately did was we got her a three milligram vape so she wouldn't smoke. And she ended up finding that it gave her something else to do instead of cutting. You know, if she started to feel anxious, if she started to feel a certain way, she just took a little puff off her vape, it gave her hand something to do, it helped take down her anxiety, it helped her focus on something else, and if she wasn't smoking, which was good, um, and she still uses some little pod-based thing now, I couldn't tell what it was, but uh, th so, so that makes me think, okay, so if we start taking away the nicotine and saying, if we stick with this whole philosophy that people only use nicotine because they're addicted to nicotine and we need to get all these people off of the nicotine because there's no benefit to nicotine. So for that, for that belief to keep going, we need to, they need to tell us what they're going to give them instead, because what's worse, my daughter cutting herself or having a little bit of nicotine. What was worse for this woman? I mean, she was able to give up all those medications and stuff. Uh, my mom suffered from depression and had this was, uh, and she had all sorts of colitis of all things. And she had quit smoking when she was really young, and and she ended up dying of brain cancer. And I don't know if all these medications she was taking might have had something to do it. I have no idea. But I've never had to take any kind of medication, and it runs in my in my family because I feel like that's my thing. That you know I don't overeat as bad because I've got something else to do instead of, if I did not have my vape but during the weeks that I've had to not do it because I had to take a test or something, I eat like crazy. <laughs> I know I would put tons of weight back on, but mom was morbidly obese, you know? Um, so just so many issues. And sometimes I wondered if she had just kept using nicotine when she was young, would she have still been morbidly obese? Would she still had, you know, had, had to be on all these different medications, Would she had had her alter ulcerative colitis, you know, it, all those things. It's like we going on this assumption that nicotine has no benefit. So you just have to get rid of it is ignoring all that. And they're not taking into account that people are going to look for something else to replace it because they, in their mind, this is tobacco control, by the way, in their mind, it's just an addiction. That's all it is. There's no benefit to it. And we just need to get people off of it. So they're not hurting themselves and they're not taking into account all the harm that could happen when people don't have that for them anymore. And that was kind of where I was going with this whole thing is that, yeah, I think it has absolute benefits. So I'm John. I'm sorry. Did I talk too much? No, <laughs> I was no, no. To get all 
<laughs> fast. I, I, I want to give you the easy out of not having to try to figure out the conclusion over and over again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Thank and you just me. jump in. And, and, and I think it, it, hopefully all I can do really is add to what you've laid out here um, and say, uh, and also, you know, this is something that Michelle men, men, Minton mentioned on the, the, the Mackinac podcast. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think one thing that we can all say is that people use drugs for reasons. Uh, and one of the, the things that is so incredibly disingenuous about all of the things that tobacco control is putting out there um, it, it, it completely ignores that fact about substance use, that we have reasons for using drugs. Uh, nicotine certainly included in that. Uh, and, you know, one of the most offensive things, you know, the, the, the whole like depression stick thing was just is wildly inappropriate. And I hope that that, that has been it, it, that that stupid campaign has run its course. Um, but, it, you know, when we hear from tobacco control about why people use any tobacco or nicotine product, it all comes down to marketing and, of course, uh, representation in 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 media like movies and TV shows. Even tobacco <clears throat> and, companies, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that basically dismisses all of the reasons that you've laid out here for why people might choose to use nicotine. And I, I think it's it's an incredibly dangerous narrative because, you know, especially when we're talking about young people who are, are experiencing all of the stressors and anxieties of the world uh, and, and gravitate towards self-medication that now it's not so much that, that their issues are being acknowledged as a, a reaction to trauma or, or just the, the violence of the world. <clears throat> and now it's that, no, you, you're using drugs. That's your problem. And of course, all of the moral judgments that come along with using any kind of substance, I, I think really just makes matters worse for young people. It certainly makes matters worse for for anybody of all ages, but but specifically young people, um, and then uh, so I, yeah, I mean that 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 has to stop. That it just it, it yeah, I'm not in any position to you know with any authority say hey knock it off tobacco control. But I think one of the themes that we'll see coming, hopefully coming out of this discussion about the benefits of very real benefits of nicotine. Uh, is that these these anti these, these disinformation campaigns coming these very Russian disinformation campaigns coming from tobacco <laughs> control needs to stop. Like um, our bots. Yeah, like our like the bots that try to post in our chat when we do this. Listen, podcast. the Russian bots in chat to me are just a confirmation that we're getting somewhere. Okay. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, I and you know, some of the other things uh, I we've actually heard from from academics, or at least one academic, um, that that there are people in academia who do use nicotine patches or nicotine gum as a performance enhancing drug. Uh, and I think one of the links uh, that you shared when we were sort of in the pre show um, was uh, athletes using uh, nicotine for performance enhancement increases their focus, or maybe this, I think this is part of Jim's article. Uh, increases focus, yeah. focus reduces reaction time, which is an improvement. Um, and it, you know, we've talked about this before with uh, sort of the tobacco-free baseball movement that we've endured here in the United States. Is that you know, if Major League Baseball is going to ban tobacco use, they should do it because it's a performance-enhancing drug, not because of some other health issue. Um, it's, you know, I, anyway, I, and I don't even want to get into the whole performance enhancing drug thing, considering what's been going on with the Olympics lately, um, <laughs> which is just a huge debacle. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think those were some of the points that, that, that came to mind. The other thing is, um, to some extent, I, I guess I maybe can ex express some, some empathy or understanding with uh, at least the medical communities. Um, uh, perhaps aggressiveness toward uh, people who are self-medicating with nicotine. You know, in the, the, the 15th and 16th century, when, you know, the European world uh, was exposed to tobacco, it very quickly became adopted as a panacea. It was used to treat everything from gangrene to headaches to the common cold. Uh, and and it, it, it is not useful for all things, obviously. Um, but it, it is one of those things that sort of falls under folk medicine. 
Uh, and we know from, you know, this is why we have a food and drug administration in the United States, because right. people were able to go out there and promote their snake oil that either had no benefits at all, or, or maybe it was toxic. Uh, and so without that regulator to step in and test these products, people were using all kinds of things. People were selling all kinds of things and, and actually harming uh, the population. And so right. we don't actually want to go back to that. Uh, but now that, that, we are looking at, and, and this story that, that you are, are reading about this woman who was able to uh, stop using all of these other medications just by, you know, using nicotine. And I think Skip had even mentioned in here using nicotine for, uh, for her uh, ADHD uh, as well. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies have a dog in this fight. And if we are encouraging people to use a, a, a relatively mild and benign substance like nicotine to treat mild symptoms or, or generally just symptoms of things like schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, and so on, uh, then that's taking money out of pharmaceutical companies' pockets who are, you know, crafting these, these pills specifically to treat things that uh, you end up having to take another pill to treat the side effects that get from that pill. And then you got to take another pill and this pill, which is just <laughs> money, money, money. Um, I but, you know, I, I don't think... Just to, just to kind of put a, another, you know, maybe qualifier on this is that I don't think that, you know, having this discussion about the benefits of nicotine, none of us are here saying that this is a panacea. Uh, and I think that there's a responsible way to inform the public that, um, you know, perhaps you don't need to go for heavy medication in order to treat some of these issues. Uh, it, it could be something as, I mean, you know, look, if we're out there promoting things like acupuncture and yoga and physical exercise, Certainly for people who might need a little bit more than that, um, something is readily available and, and isn't going to create massive health problems for you as, as a, a smoke-free nicotine product. Um, that, that's something we should acknowledge as part of people's tool, toolkits for, for addressing these health issues. Yeah, I agree 100%. I've just been jotting down notes because I have... I have... I have a whole mess of things that I, I would love to contribute to this conversation. Um, first, uh, Kristen, uh, you know, with your daughter and, and self-harm, I have a history of self-harm. Um, my shoulders and upper biceps, biceps are, are riddled with scars. I used to cut as well. Um, so much love. Uh, that's a, it's a difficult thing to, to get through uh, and, and move on with. Um, nicotine, nicotine benefits me in a lot of ways in regards to my mental health from focus, uh, and depression. Um, so nicotine is, is a really important thing for me. Um, but I, I wanted to highlight a few things out of this, uh, sweets, sweets, diabetes. This is something, uh, this is a, a subject close to my heart. My, my grandma died from diabetes. Um, and she was a, she was a lifelong heavy smoker. I can remember actually being at the hospital with her when the doctors were having a conversation with her about possibly having to amputate her foot, um, mm -hmm. which is, is due to circulation and lots of things like that. Um, and they told her that she needed to quit smoking, which she did do for a whole three weeks. Uh, and her solution uh, when she started smoking again was to smoke ultralights. That was her solution, <laughs> you know, because they're ultra light. It doesn't count. Um but yeah, diabetes sweets. I, I did a I did a, a, a kind of a deep dive into uh, smoking and vaping and diabetes years ago, um, and I, I spoke to a number of great people. This is again, I'm not trying to flaunt my old podcast. You can't even listen to it anymore. It's 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 gone. But uh, I interviewed a number of people who were diabetic uh, who who had switched, um, and it's it's a really cool thing. I, you know, this is one of those those we don't talk about these benefits around vaping. We focus so heavily on just, you know, quitting smoking. And that's kind of mm -hmm. where the general conversation ends. But one of the the kind of incredible things for for people who are diabetic, if you are diabetic, smoking is is a is just icing it on the cake. So much worse. It, it's yeah. it makes everything so much worse. So much worse um, in regards to your your overall health. Um, but switching um, not only is that beneficial period, you know, quitting smoking is beneficial period. Um, but another thing that people found was being able to replace the, the, you know, I can't have, you know, uh, I can't have a dozen cookies and milk after dinner as a dessert, but I can vape, uh, a cookies and cream or like a, a cookie dessert bakery or something like that. Something sweet. I can vape that 
instead of having this dessert. Uh, so still being able to have and enjoy something that's sweet um, is really beneficial to a lot of people with diabetes as far as weight and obesity and all these things go. Uh, and I know that there's some general kind of concern about blood glu glucose levels. Um, everything that I've looked into, all the research that I've found and everybody that I've spoken to, uh, even in even in some of the sweetest liquids that they vape, they do not notice any significant rise in their blood glucose levels. Uh, so that's I know for some people that's kind of a concern. Um, again, I'm not a researcher, scientist, or doctor, but everything that I've seen up to now and everyone that I've spoken to, um, you know, who regularly check their blood glucose levels, they, they vape sweet, sweet liquids, do not notice any significant rise. No, um, I just to talk about that because I do, you know, I've done low carbon keto for years now. And, um, I actually have a vaping low carb vapors group. If anybody wants to join it on Facebook, if you're interested, um, but uh, no, most of them, the thing is, is that's usually going to be something that's got sugar or carbs in it. And most of these things are sweetened, you know, the veg, the glycerin and the uh, sweeteners they use are not something that are going to spike your blood sugar. And I've come across other people who were doing low carb and uh, keto and vaping, and they were concerned about whether or not it does it. And they've tested their blood sugar after vaping. It doesn't have really any, anything can actually spike your blood sugar short term. It's just a matter of how long it keeps it going and what it does to your right. metabolism. Um, Cause sometimes just thinking about eating can spike your blood sugar, <laughs> not even mm -hmm. putting anything in your mouth yet. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff about that, but yeah, it definitely can help people who have diabetes um, stay away from the actual sweets for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just one of the most, you know, for me, it was it was an incredible thing to, to sit and listen to people talk about this. Um, I, I, I still have these recordings somewhere. Maybe I'll re-release like a whole bunch of them, uh, especially some of the deeper dives that I did. I did them on diabetes and COPD and asthma and um, and actually uh, drug recovery as well. Um, but diabetes was a really was one that hit really close to home. Um, but I think it's 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 definitely a benefit for people uh, to echo off of, of um, I believe it was Alex was talking about why people use drugs. Uh, people use drugs initially be, or or go back to using a drug and continue to use a drug because it benefits them. Uh, whether we notice that uh, really upfront and it's apparent to us or if it's something kind of uh, in the subconscious that we, we get a benefit from it. But human beings don't tend to do something and then do it again, and then do it again reason. if it doesn't benefit yeah. us. Um, I, I'm, I'm a stimulant user. The, these stimulants have been my drugs of choice for ever. Um, you know, when I was uh, 15, I shattered, shattered my ankle. I have a metal plate and eight screws mm -hmm. in there. Uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, I was on morphine. I was given painkillers uh, afterwards. Um, and this is kind of one of those things that I, I guess is re you know reaffirms that or, or concretes that idea and that i had no issues with those drugs um they you know they helped me heal they were you know they they did what they needed to do um but i didn't enjoy it i didn't benefit from them in any other way outside of it being a medication to help me deal with this thing right here and now um whereas stimulants for me are like my brain is happy. I benefit from stimulants. I enjoy them very much. Uh, they perk me up. They help my mood. Uh, they help my focus. They help my attention, all of those things. They're happy things for my brain. And I think subconsciously when I was younger and I had started smoking, I noticed that, or at least my brain took note of that. Uh, and so I continued to use stimulants and I actively saw other stimulants later on in life that were a bit more potent than nicotine. Um, but yeah, people, that that's that's where uh, you know drug use starts is because that drug is beneficial to that individual and so you use again and you use and so on and so forth from there and dependency and things like that we can talk about at another time but yes um, no I, then, I'm just um, gonna say I I totally agree with you because I've often brought up the point that they always say that you're just addic addicted to nicotine and that's why you keep using it but three kids quit through my all my pregnancies I've said this before. After a year, I'm not still addicted to nicotine, but I wanted to have something. So <clears throat> that had nothing to do with still being a nick being addicted and just wanting it because sure. I was having withdrawal a year later. So I always thought that was baloney. And that's not to say that like repetitive use can definitely lead to dependency. 
Uh, and, and withdrawal is definitely a key part in someone using a substance, again, returning to use that substance. I know when I need some nicotine, I, I know when I'm experiencing those withdrawals and, and I, you know, I, I have a vape. Um, so it's not to say, you know, that, you know, if you use this substance over and over again, you won't become dependent or you won't, you know, develop an addiction or substance use disorder oh, oh, to yeah. it. That's absolutely not the case. You can very much so. Um, but the reasons behind why people initiate substance use to begin with, um, there's a lot of reasons, but benefits are, are one. And, and people also need to acknowledge that most illicit drugs that we've coined to be, you know, bad, immoral, whatever, are, are, that are illegal now were A, once upon a time legal, and B, most of them are uh, either the same or an analog or a version of a legal drug that is in fact a medication. Uh, we look at my things daughter like Adderall. Got yeah. Yeah. So my daughter is diacetyl morphine. Diacetyl morphine is is heroin. Diacetyl morphine is used um, in in a lot of places around the world still as a medication. Uh, people, you know, the, this this fentanyl hysteria that we're in right now, dealing with this overdose crisis, fentanyl is still used every day in hospitals. Yeah. It's very tightly regulated and and. You know, it's used by professionals and anesthesiologists, but it is used as a medication every single day, every day around the world. Um, so that it's something to, to bear in mind when we're talking about drugs. Um, and Alex, I think I was just trying to say that. I'm sorry, real quick. I was just trying to say is that obviously I was I was getting some kind of benefit from the nicotine that I was missing that had nothing mm -hmm. to do with my being dependent on it a year later. So right, I was looking, right. <clears throat> that's why I went back to it is what I was trying to say is that there was yeah, some benefit. Absolutely. I think, I, I think <clears throat> just about everybody that I know that uses nicotine every day benefits from it in some form or fashion uh, outside of just not smoking cigarettes. Um, or if they that's are smoking just cigarettes. Wants to convince us though. The only yeah, they don't want us to acknowledge years, any benefits. No. After um, years and of I, not smoking, I went back because somehow I was still addicted to nicotine. <laughs> yeah, not, I mean, there's no, a year later, you're not physically dependent on something that you haven't used in a year. Right. And just the, nothing works that way. Um, no. And I don't remember exactly what this was. This is my focus here. And it's just because I'm tired today. I jotted down, um, you know, we focus on, we focus so heavily on, on drugs. I don't remember exactly what Alex had said uh, in relation to this note, but we focus so heavily on drugs and not the underlying issues uh, that people have in regards to drug use. You know, when we talk about poverty, we talk about mental health, we talk about all these things. Right. It's so quick. Low hanging fruit is the drug. You know, if, if people are using drugs and they also are experiencing homelessness, uh, poverty, all these other things, mental health issues, our, our first instinct is to go, oh, it's the drugs. It, it's got to be the drugs. Um, and we do that as a society, not just individually, we do that as a society for people, as opposed to actually addressing or looking at the underlying issues of why somebody started using these drugs in the first place. Um, and that's something that we, we really do, you know, as, 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 a, as a society need to uh, start moving towards actually looking at the underlying issues um, right. and not just someone's drug use. Um, I scribbled down brain poison with a whole bunch of question marks because we talk about <laughs> cognitive benefits. Um, and, and uh, you know, there, there's a lot of data out there on uh, nicotine being uh, essentially a cognitive booster for attention, for focus. Um, like Alex was talking about, uh, um, you know, um, help me out here again. I'm on three hours. Academics sleep, using, using NRT. No, um, reaction time, reaction speed. Reaction time. Um, yeah. And so there's there's a lot of data out there on that. And then we circle back and we see these campaigns in California that say nicotine is brain poison. Um, really? It's not the greatest it's generation. Not it's actually, I, I think I think the percent basic, smoking. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I think I think the whole I mean, the whole brain poison campaign, it's 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 just, you know, it's part and parcel of what I was saying before that, you know, tobacco control is so eager to pin this on marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, you know, it, it's it's this idea that tobacco companies are trying to convince you that you need nicotine in your life. You need their products in their life. I mean, sure. Like what manufacturer doesn't say that about their dumb product? Man, we can walk around our individual houses and just fill up a dumpster with stuff that we don't need. 
that we bought thinking that, you know, the advertising said it was going to make us feel happier and more secure, whatever it is, everybody does it. But at the end of the day, we, we made the choice to do that. We are the ones that discovered buying this thing or consuming this drug or whatever made us feel better. And, and I, I, it, it, you know, the real brain poison here is trying to convince people that we don't have any agency. I think right. that's absolutely we're just victims. The, that's that's one of the most harmful things yeah. that yeah. tobacco control is engaged just in. Just blame yeah, big we're tobacco. All, we're all blame victims big tobacco. of aggressive marketing. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like um, like Joe Camel ever made anyone smoke or that? I mean, to me, all the advertising was branding. It's it's like okay, we're targeting people who are smoking. You know, and and yeah, giving away free cigarettes at like high schools and to soldiers. Yeah, that's that's underhanded. And some of the stuff that they're doing in 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 you know low income countries and stuff. But this whole idea that seeing people smoking in in a movie or now vaping or that that you know menthol, you know, oh, you always see that they blame the tobacco companies for making black people use menthol. Cause they advertise menthol in there. So just, they just got a bug up their butt one day and say, you know, Hey, let's mess around with the black people and make them do more menthol. And just put the menthol ads. No, <laughs> there was a preference. They saw a market and started advertising. Hey, we have menthol too. buy our menthol, you know, and now tobacco controls turned that completely around and said they targeted and made black people smoke menthol. It's I've, it's the same thing with the flavors and vaping. You know, they I mean, say, oh, well, kids are, are kids are vaping because there's all these great flavors like Skittles. Well, I'm always like, well, wouldn't it be cheaper and easier for them to just get a friggin' bag of Skittles? Why are they? No, obviously they want the vape for something else, not the flavors, just the flavors. It's just a ridiculous thing, you know? Sorry. I, 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 well, I did just want to like <laughs> jump in and, and either clarify <laughs> or push back or offer clarification by way of pushback uh, on the whole menthol thing and that. You know, I, I, I don't want what you just said to be construed in any way of, uh, as letting tobacco companies off the hook. Menthol, of I course, know, was, you, you know, th there is that that established preference for menthol cigarettes in the black community. And the fact that the egregious thing is that uh, tobacco companies did target the black community with even if you're just out there saying, yes, we have menthols, too. It's that this community was was specifically targeted with a known harmful product. Uh, and and that's that's really the big issue and, and something that we stated in our own position statement, Kassau's position statement about this menthol ban is that, you know, we have to acknowledge that the only reason to add menthol to a combustible product is to sell more of that product. It, it's it's not because it imparts any kind of health benefits or or, or makes the product less hmm. harmful. It is just to sell more products to a, a targeted demographic who it exhibits a preference for that flavor. Um, so I I, I I I just I, I'm all sensitive to that. I, I don't want to anybody to, too, to though, get this idea not... that we're apologists for you know cigarette no, no. makers. I, yeah. and I and I threw that out there when I was talking about what they're doing in low income countries and stuff like that. That they're still they're giving giving cigarettes to kids and advertising, you know, at high schools and stuff like that. So I'm not yeah. saying that they don't do underhanded crap right, and right. that they did, but it's just this whole idea that, that it's, it's like what uh, I think Skip said it in the chat that most kids start smoking because their parents are smoking and most kids will start smoking whatever it was their parents were smoking. So you ended up with that general, well, it's general the, yeah, it's the most readily available thing, thing yeah. with menthol. And the most, yeah. And then like my husband, he grew up in a low income neighborhood, which was very racially mixed. Most of his friends were black. He was a menthol smoker. It was what was around, you know? So, I mean, he didn't buy it because there was an ad for menthol in that neighborhood. It was just what those people wanted. You know, it's like, like anything else. And I'm just saying that to, to, to boil it down to that, to make it all because of big, evil tobacco companies is kind of like what you said about taking agency and, you know, and saying, Hey, I chose to do this knowing fully well, anybody after 1985 who started smoking knows full well what the risks were. So this whole idea that we were somehow coerced by big tobacco and now we hate big tobacco for addicting us. That's, that's just baloney, you know, and the fact that there is some benefits to it and what's going to happen when, it's all gone. I mean, look at my mom. She quit smoking and she ended up getting morbidly obese, all sorts of, all sorts of colitis and 
tons of different medications, people are going to replace a drug if you take it away. We've seen that with other, you know, with when you, when they banned other drugs in the past, when they did it with, with alcohol, when they banned it, people tried to replace it with other stuff. And they're going to do the same thing when it comes to nicotine. And you have to ask the question, what are they going to take that might be so much worse for them? I, I'm convinced that using nicotine has helped keep me off of having to take antidepressants and becoming morbidly obese. For all I know, it's kept me from having having ulcerative colitis if that runs in families. I don't know. But where would I be if I hadn't had nicotine all this time? And if I had just quit, would I be on Xanax or something else like that? You know, so to me, that's the benefit that I've gotten from the nicotine. I'm, I'm fully convinced of it. I really am, you know, sorry. My, um, <laughs> I'm getting really worked up today. I don't know. No, why. no, that, I, yeah, this, this is a good great topic. I'm yeah, this is, this is good. Uh, I only have, Two last key points that I, I wrote down, um, you know, we, we Alex talked about the FDA and uh, why we have a Food and Drug Administration. And, it's, you know, so we can we can follow the science behind products. We can make sure that people aren't, you know, necessarily or unnecessarily being harmed by people promoting things like, you know, snake oils and whatever. Um, the flip side to this is when the public loses distrust or loses trust in these institutions, we backpedal, we go backwards, we go back to things like snake oil, I got it. because we, we don't trust these institutions. Uh, and so people fall back on, you know, other remedies and, and things like that. All I did was I wrote down distrust with an arrow to snake oil. Um, <laughs> because that's, I mean, that's really, um, you know, that's, that's the honest truth. And we, we see this more and more every day. Um, distrust and, mm -hmm. and thing, you know, institutions like the CDC, the FDA, um, that's why we have a whole world of anti-vaxxers and things like this. Um, and my last point here to kind of build off of the cognitive benefits, and it's just something that I've noticed myself um, and in the gaming community. Uh, people who know me know I've, I've been gaming for most of my life before I ever made content uh, around vaping or tobacco harm reduction or anything like that. I used to stream video games. I've been playing video games long before I ever started smoking. Um, but I know... Uh, within that community, within the gaming community, there are a lot of people who smoke. Um, I used to take breaks, smoke breaks. I still play video games with people who take smoke breaks, or, or I can hear people vaping through my headset and things like that. And I think that is, again, reaction time, attention, focus, all those things, um, that, that cognitive benefit. And when I, years ago, I used to stream on a, on a platform that's no longer around, um, but before I was done streaming on that platform was around the same time that I quit smoking in 2017. And when I started learning more about nicotine and, and you know, our, our brains and, and smoking and all of these things, some of the last streams that I was doing on that platform were uh, talking about vaping. And it's something I've gone back to. I've started streaming again on Twitch this past year uh, and to try to incorporate some of these things into that community because I know that I know that community really well. Uh, and I, I feel like I have a, a good spot to talk about these things with people who come into my streams who who may be curious. Um, but I think there are a lot of people out there in that community who who could definitely benefit from obviously switching, um, but who benefit in general from nicotine. Uh, just because of, you know, video gaming is such a, a demand on the brain, all these things, especially when people are playing like these really intense, you know, um, really quick reaction time kind of games. Um, but yeah, that's, but that's, that's all my, this is my, my notepad for anybody who wants to see how horribly chicken scratched uh, <laughs> that is. But, but yeah, I mean, there, there are clearly, there are clearly benefits to um, not only nicotine, but why people use any substance in general. And I think it's, it's really uh, dishonest and disingenuous uh, that we, we cover them up, we lie about them, um, you know, just so that way we can, we can continue our, our, I don't know, prohibitionist march to get rid of these things or whatever, create this, this drug-free imaginary world uh, and we don't acknowledge people's, you know, stories. We don't acknowledge people's benefits and needs, individual needs and, and whatnot. So that's all I got. That's it for my chicken scratch. That was good chicken scratch. Thanks. <laughs> that was good chicken. <laughs> I was a little, all I was watching the, in the, yeah. uh, a few hours in the chat, they were talking about, 
in the chat, they were talking about stuff that their moms were smoking and stuff. I saw the Virginia Slims 120s. I think I had 120s at one point. Do you guys remember in the 80s, Capris? Oh, yeah. I don't know if they uh, still make no, them or not. I don't. They were these, they were about half <laughs> the width of a regular cigarette. They were 100s. I don't think that one. <laughs> they were 100s, but they were about, they, you know, they were much skinnier. They were very skinny. And um, I was tending bar at the time. And, and uh, I loved them because when they went out, if you, they went out and stopped burning and you could relight them and they didn't have that horrible taste when you relight a cigarette. Mm -hmm. But uh, the funny thing is, I thought I was just thinking about those is that they were technically half a cigarette, but they took as long to smoke as a regular cigarette. So you had all the hand mouth getting the stuff, but you were really smoking half the tobacco with each cigarette. In a way, it was kind of harm reduction, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. I mean, in a way, it's like cutting. I'm, I, I went from basically smoking a whole pack of cigarette a night at the bar when I was working to smoking a half a pack. How much? How much, what, how much was a pack of Capris compared to a pack of Camels? Is it the same oh, price? Same price, yeah. It's probably yeah, a little so more. Not, not harm reduction, uh, cost reduction. Not cost, no, not cost. Not <laughs> I don't but remember I Capris because I was to... born in 91. Um, <laughs> this was so in the 90s. I don't remember the 80s at days. all. Uh, I was ass. I was non-existent. Um, but I've I've I do I've actually smoked a Virginia Slim, uh, and I've smoked a Misty, uh, which is kind of along the same lines. Um, were Virginia Slim skinny like that too? I thought they were just really long, like 120s. I didn't think that they were actually. Are, are Virginia Slims? I thought they were also can. skinnier. Were they super as well? skinny? I don't know, but I'm going to start yawning. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> what off topic? What, what off I topic. what I think of when I think of like a half a cigarette are the 72s. You ever smoke a 72? <laughs> I remember so my one and <laughs> only so interaction with a 72. <laughs> was asking a friend i was i was working um i was working retail at the time this was a long mind. time ago i was maybe like 17. and i remember asking my friend like hey can i bum a smoke off of you and they pulled out a 72 and i was like <laughs> can i bum two smokes off of you <laughs> that was because they're real, that, they're Alex, real short. you said it doesn't save money as a bartender smoking the capris Guys didn't want to bump a cigarette from me as much, hey, so I did not go through as many. Didn't save me. They didn't want that. Well, you know, when when <laughs> when I was really... a kid, that was why that was why oh, I started okay. smoking menthols because none of my friends wanted menthol. Thanks, Green. So I, yeah. I could save my allowance yeah. money and just smoke my Marlboro menthols, and no one would mess with me. Yeah, <laughs> I was a I was a, a full flavor red uh, smoker for a long time, and until I. That's uh, my dad. Till I got with my ex, who was uh, an adamant, she was a Newport stand. That was it. There was, it didn't matter if she, she, had, she could go, you know, it, it had been all day long. She hadn't had a cigarette all day. And somebody was like, Hey, do you want to, you know, whatever red or something? No, she would much rather like, like dwell in her agony than smoke a full play. It had to be a Newport. And so in turn, there was like two or three years there where that was all I smoked was Mental, so does the but... chat have any questions about nicotine or anything about this or any stories they want to tell real quick because we're going to start wrapping it up um how it helps you or anything like that otherwise i think i asked this earlier right. so nobody really came back so i think we're safe to maybe start because we are I, on quite yeah late. We, we we definitely need to come to a close here but i will add one thing um uh, inspired by all of our talk about specific brands of cigarettes, you know, under some other situations, other circumstances, we might have to do something like issue a trigger warning or uh, just know sure, that, yeah. that people may feel triggered by this conversation. But True. I don't feel that worried about this crowd because I know oh. that just about everybody here listening and watching can just take a pull off their vape and, and move on with their day. They have an alternative. Um, so, you know, if there are any researchers in the audience and maybe want to re look into um, something along those lines of uh, perhaps relapse prevention, um, that might be a good thing to to look at. But uh, sorry for anybody who who does feel triggered, but just hit your vape or pop in a snooze and trust me, you'll be fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Another benefit. 
All right. All right. So everybody's starting to say goodbye. You guys, thank you so much. We had a pretty good crowd today and some of you stuck through to the end. I saw kind of the number kind of going up and down at some points. I don't know if I lost them at uh, talking about, uh, what was I talking about slash or something? I don't know. Oh, we got into a uh, snooze. So maybe, maybe you lost some people there. I don't know, but some came back. Some came back. People come and go. Thanks for they stopping by. Thanks for sticking around. You guys wouldn't do without you. And thanks awesome. for all the great comments and chat. Is it spiel time? It is spiel time. It's spiel time. Okay. <clears throat> all right, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to echo Alex and Kristen. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I know we kind of ran long, uh, but there are weeks where, you know, we bang out a show in like an hour. You know, so every now and again, those those shows that run long, it all it all comes out in the wash at the end. Right. We're so unprepared for this show. I thought for sure. <laughs> These are some of the best shows, though. When we take <laughs> Alex's lead and we wing it, there's some of the best shows. <laughs> um, but thank you again, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, there will be two podcasts. Uh, actually, there's going to be three podcasts that are going to uh, come out on Monday. Uh, first, obviously, the full uh, episode that you've you've sat for two hours and 15 minutes through already that episode will be available for everybody to tune into. There's also going to be a shorthand version of this episode, which is Alex running through all of the legislative goody goodness for everybody. You got that quick commute to work. You can tune into that, get all the need to know information last week or this, this past week was actually Kassam's first Twitter space, uh, which we're going to be doing uh, kind of bi-weekly every other week or so. Uh, on Twitter now. So please, if you're not following Kasa on Twitter, uh, go hit that follow button. Uh, and those, those you'll see tweets every now and again, twice a month come up uh, for a Twitter space. You can easily click the set reminder button that's on that tweet. So you get a reminder when we do go live to tune in. Uh, this past week <clears throat> was an excellent conversation. I highly recommend everybody tune in. We had Ethan Nadelman on uh, to talk about um, THR and and drug harm relation drug harm reduction and how they relate and how we've kind of ended up in this silo in tobacco harm reduction. I don't want to get too much into it because I want you guys to listen to it. It's a really great, uh, great conversation uh, that will also be going up on the SoundCloud and then, you know, broadcast into all the other apps where you listen to your podcast. So uh, you'll you'll start to see an additional podcast come up as well. There won't be quite as many of those as, as we have of these. Highly recommend you guys tune into that as well. Uh, if you're not a part of Kasa, I don't know what to tell you at this point. You're doing everything wrong. Just stop everything you're doing. Go uh, become a member of Kasa. It's absolutely free. Uh, you can get all of the, the calls to action, get all the email notifications, all those things, and check out our merch page while you're there. Danielle Jones has some really awesome merch up. It's a great way to support Kasa. Uh, on top of if you feel like contributing, if you feel like donating, we could definitely use the support. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, I believe, as far as I know, we are all here next week, same time, same place. I haven't heard any discussions of actually so first so actually good. i can't say that uh -oh. because i may not be here i don't i don't know what today is right now what is today saturday of the month <laughs> the i don't 19th. know what today is the, the 19th. 19th it's the 19th it's the 19th saturday. i will not be here well, i will actually not be here next week i am going to be in a whole different state next saturday oh, so maybe, um, maybe we'll take so, a bye week or maybe yeah, alex heads up hey watch. alex Chris, be you guys know, you don't know i'm not gonna be about. here next week uh <laughs> so i won't be here next week but i don't so i don't know what that means for alex and Kristen. they're gonna have to figure that yeah, out no, hopefully there's a stream out. i don't know sorry to do this live you guys sorry to drop okay. that bomb on you live um <laughs> but otherwise out about it on friday so yeah, yeah true that's true. Like, oh, yeah, two hours before the stream. Like, oh, hey, yeah. just so you guys know. <laughs> um, so hopefully uh, hopefully there'll be a, a show next week. If there is a show next week, it'll be the same time, same place, uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 over on the other coast. You got to do your Google food for the rest of the world. That is it. Yes, Mallory Gates, that's where I'll be. Um, so thank you one last time. Everybody thank be you. excellent to each other. Yeah, that's I will be in Ohio. Um, be excellent to each other. Till next time, take care, everybody. <laughs>